No. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Hello. Can you uh, hear us? If you can, uh, type something in chat. Awesome. Um, we're just getting, yep, cool. Um, we're just getting uh, set up here. Um, yeah, just chatting. How's uh, everyone doing? Oh, well, we'll work their way, and I'll take the answer. Uh, doing pretty good. <laughs> One second. Um, OK. It's cold in San Diego. I would be very curious about what cold is defined to you, Dan. I assume that's Dan. Yeah. <laughs> 20 degrees Celsius is cold. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. That's Toronto summer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah. If, um, also, if anyone wants to follow along, we'll just be working from the raw node template. Um, uh, of course, you know this is all recorded. So uh, if you don't, if you can't quite follow along at our pace, whatever, um, that's fine. You can always go back and watch it again. But um, yeah, I and mean, anybody who's worried about that, I'll be slowing Sean down a bit here and there because yeah. I try to follow along with him. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see. Let me just make sure I have everything else in my head that I want. So yeah, one more thing to note. Um, this is a pretty. Um, I mean, I have. I had. So we're gonna go over the, the core. Of this is gonna be talking about fees and hopefully targeting towards the fee-less transaction system. I think this is something that um, a lot of people want, and you know, definitely when they have the ability to program their own blockchain, that's kind of the first thing that comes up. Uh, we all know that fees are kind of one of the things that uh, can block new users from using your blockchain. Um, or even existing users from like using it frequently, right? So um, this is something that we can definitely do in Substrate. Um, I would say that I have a general idea, of kind of a basic, um, simple palette, which doesn't modify the core parts of Frame or Substrate, um, um, that will work as a fee-less transaction system. Um, but you know, I would say it's not a not a very mature implementation. It's just kind of just get something working, shows you like the basics, and. Uh, if you all have ideas that you know we could practically implement in the time that we have, um, that would be cool to hear too. So maybe like either ask a question or post something in chat, and maybe we can start um, looking at those ideas and implementing it. But just something to think about um, as we're doing this. That um, you know you can definitely give us some input and we can try to play around. And yeah, just while well, like I guess we have a few time, like just while well, implementing this in general, um, careful with fee list transactions because that could cause you know bloat and denial of service attacks. But yeah, if tax. you but if you like think like, hey, you know, this is beneficial enough, like this action is beneficial enough to the blockchain that it should be, you know, subsidized, then there's always extra logic you can add in to be like, hey, you know, let's say we're doing a trading, um, like a trading order book type blockchain, right? Like, oh, make sure that an order is this size, and that's worth it for the system to have a fee-less transaction. There's always right. other stuff you can add in. Logic yeah. yeah. On top of it. I would say, you know, like um, so even in Polkadot right now, we do have a few fee-less transactions. And usually these are um, uh, transactions where um, we need them to happen for the system to move forward. So an, a good example of this is um, uploading the pre-image um, to a resolved democracy proposal. So an example is like, you know, if we upgrade the runtime, um, what everyone votes on is actually just the hash. So the actual WASM for the... Um, for the upgrade isn't uploaded to the chain until after it passes. And then we upload like the two megabyte file, which is huge. And then we push it. And um, uploading that two megabyte file, if it costed a fee, um, which it was for a while, um, would cost me like $200, maybe more. Um, and then of course, uh, council would always refund that um, using tips. We would refund you know, to whoever in council was um, preparing those um, those WASM files. But the better solution here actually was to, to realize, okay, well, if we need someone to upload this file in order for the for the democracy proposal to like finish, um, we can just make it so that as long as the uploading process is um, completely correct, we can actually remove the fee at the end. And so what actually happens is, um, and this is actually what we'll probably be doing for our thing, but the steps are this, that when you start the transaction, uh, we assume that a fee will be taken. So even so, if you want to submit this WASM blob, let's say it costs $200, you actually need to start with $200 in your account. Um, then we do the transaction, and if everything succeeded successfully, like, you know, and if, in terms of uploading the, like, the WASM blob, we have to check that the hash is the same 
right? We, we check that, you know, that um, the proposal is actually approved, like all the basic pieces of it. Um, once we've done that, then we can say at the end of the transaction, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give back the fee. We don't need to um, use it to pay any fee. And basically that's that. But there is this still kind of a, uh, of a thing where you basically need to have the user to have some fee to begin with. And I think this is actually pretty important for any um, fee-less blockchain. What you can't do is just um, set up your blockchain so that anyone can do transactions without fees. Um, because basically what could happen then is that accounts with no balances at all, basically like randomly generated accounts, could then trigger um, can trigger transactions. And that would basically open you up to a DOS attack like very easily. What you, what you should do, and I think what we're going to be focusing on, is, is taking a user who has some balance in your system, at least has the existential deposit, right? Or at least has enough to, to pay for the transaction if something bad were to happen. And then um, basically check that the transaction is good within all of the you know, facets that we, we want to check, and then take away the fee there. And so in some sense, we still have some civil resistance because users need to have like some kind of non-zero balance account to, to do this. Um, but, uh, you know, and they need to go through a logicator of like, Hey, you know, with that one specifically, the hash was correct. Like, yeah, you know, you're getting charged if it's not. Exactly. So this is the kind of thing you think about. So, you know, the, again, what we'll be showing you here will probably be, um, will be, uh, you know, touching a little pieces. It probably won't be perfect, but these are the kinds of things you need to keep in mind when you're designing any type of system without fees. Um, you need to have the right, basically economics that how do you prevent attackers from abusing this fee-less system, right? Um, so the qu a question was asked by Dan, uh, we'll be using signed extensions. So I think right now, we, uh, for my simple implementation, we will not be needing to use signed extensions. Um, but I can imagine a more complex example where you're maybe changing even the transaction payment palette. You, you could use signed extensions, but it's, it's definitely possible we can maybe jump in to signed extensions um, if we can think of a good idea on how to implement it. But my, my basic idea right now is not going to use it. So let me talk about my basic idea. Let me actually check that my, my thing is finished compiling. Shit. Let's see what happened here. <laughs> ah, okay. Give me one second. Um, I need to install. So I was I, I was silly, of course, and I um, updated my um, uh, Rust, and so I need to <laughs> go back yeah. and get the right nightly. Yeah. In the meantime, I can go but... over um, just to like reiterate what Sean was saying, and maybe a little bit more depth um, in Ethereum, which of course is something that you can definitely see. Um, there had been situations of dosing attacks because um, opcodes were in price right. So it's a really real attack and a really real thing. Think about this. Every transaction you make needs to be replicated on thousands of machines. It's not just regular computing. Um, so not pricing things correctly. Um, and by the way, to figure out how things are priced correctly, Sean did a like, two, three weeks ago, did an excellent panel uh, seminar on weights, which is worthwhile to watch. Um, but figuring out proper, and he goes into a lot of detail on how important proper waiting is so it's quite important and getting the economic fed on that again would be very important uh, for fees how and why would you grief a user that abuses the fee-less transactions um that's a good question um so again this would be to my understanding and then we'll see a bit more um but um based on the concept that you can write your own logic on a fee-less transaction so for example um what sean was saying with the, the pre-image stuff is you know, if somebody, you take away the gas and you hold it, um, and if somebody doesn't uh, fit through some sort of logic data of like, hey, this is the correct upgrade that we all voted on, they would lose their font. So in that regard, you can kind of avoid um, a DOS attack by somebody calling that function over and over again with bad data. Um, but yeah, it's probably really important when implementing any uh, fee-less balances, like, hey, make sure you fall under these certain parameters before you're able to actually access this a free transaction. Yeah. Um, they also ask, uh, why do fees exist in the first place? Um, fees are like, I think a very fundamental part of all blockchains. Like blockchains are basically these kind of like economic systems that uh, try to um, incentivize users using basically their money. Um, and this is in all cases, like, you know, blockchains ask people to produce blocks by giving them money. Um, they ask users to use the, or they, they want users to use the blockchain. And in order to do so, they um, have to pay a fee and all that kind of stuff. So ultimately fees are kind of, they exist in order to um, basically like gate the behavior of users who are using the blockchain and um, whether we want them to, um, you know, limit uh, how much they, uh, they spam the chain with transactions or basically anything. Um, fees kind of exist to basically act as that monetary incentive mechanism. 
Um, cool. I think everything is working fine on my side. So let's, let's, talk, about, let's talk about what we're going to do. So before we actually jump into any code, and before I share my screen, let's talk about the, the general idea. OK, so um, what we're going to be doing is uh, building a, a palette, which will basically act as a, as a gateway, a wrapper, to any other call in your system. So the, the goals of this is not to get deep into substrate modifications. Like I think the, the average person here doesn't want to rewrite all of these palettes and make them done, you know, done in a way that would be better for being feeless. And the truth is that if you really wanted to build an end-to-end -end kind of feeless blockchain system, you probably would want to um, make a bunch of custom palettes. Because our palettes are not designed, like our entire frame system is not designed around like the notions of being feeless. Like the idea of weights is kind of integrated and fees are kind of integrated really deeply into everything we design because we want to make you know, your blockchain easy to make economically safe and correct, right? Um, but, uh, w you know, it's, yeah, we, we basically, if you really, really want to make a true end-to-end -end fee-less blockchain, I think you'd, you'd want to do some more low-level editing. But that's kind of not what we want to do here. What we want to do here is what can we do to take the existing substrate and frame system and modify it so that it will be fee-less? And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a palette. will basically act as a wrapper. And this um, palette, you can basically forward any call to this palette first, which will then actually trigger the call you want. And then this palette will have some logic, um, which says whether or not this transaction should be feeless. So probably what we'll do to start is we'll just create um, a palette where anyone who calls this extrinsic, it will be feeless. That's super simple. Um, and anyone can make as many feeless calls as they want. Then we'll add to it a little bit of logic, maybe some kind of just counter. We'll say, okay, every user gets um, 10 free calls every 1,000 blocks, something like that, right? And so then basically we'll have a counter basically says, oh, whenever your user calls this call, we'll check, do they have a free call available? If they do, you know, make it feeless. If they don't, just charge them a fee. So something along those lines, right? And then finally, what we might want to do is actually change it to say, okay, um, let's do it by weight. Because, you know, um, saying that you have 10 free transactions per you know, thousand blocks actually doesn't really mean much in the context of substrate because the transactions could mean extremely different things, right? Like, you know, you could have one which is just a transfer, which is quite small, or you could do something really crazy big, like an upgrade or whatever, right? So maybe instead what we should do is and say, okay, well, can we get the weight of the call that they want to make and then um, give them this much weight per 1,000 blocks, right? And then, um, and then uh, just basically track the weight there instead. And that and that end-to-end -end will kind of be... Um, what I would suspect to be a good working kind of prototype of, of how a feeless system would work, right? Um, the there will be a, there will be at least one or two tricks here to make sure that you're doing things correctly with storage. Um, but the last thing is that you know I think if you want to actually then end of the day implement something like this onto your blockchain in terms of like a user interface, it would actually be quite simple. Um, basically, um, you'd ha you'd have to probably modify the JS a little bit, but you can imagine that every single call, rather than calling the um, extrinsic directly. Like you know, you would with Polkadot.js, you would actually just wrap every call in another like helper function, which would make things feeless. And something as simple as that could turn your entire blockchain's user interface into a feeless system. And so this is so this is kind of what my my imagination of something that would actually quite work and work you know like today, and it would be quite simple for anyone to build. So right, but also yeah. don't do that because the ninth transaction of every person would be to move everything all the bounces to a new account and get 10 more free transactions. Right. So yes, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good thing too. Don't so actually we, do that. We, I mean, we can actually solve this problem today if we wanted to. So one of the ways you could solve this problem is that, you know, users could opt in to the free transaction system. And if they do, they lock their balances for those thousand blocks or something like that, right? Yeah. So if they yeah. lock their balances for a thousand blocks. Um, it's not a big deal for anyone. But uh, it basically means that during that period, they can't actually transfer their, their money anywhere else, right? Yeah, but it's a good uh, concept of system design, too, of like, all right, how do you make this um, workable for an actual production level? Exactly. Blockchain? But yeah, I mean, that's great thinking, though. You're, you're absolutely thinking the right thing. Like, a user could attack the system by just constantly transferring money to new accounts and then setting things up. So To me, they're, that's they're... a genie problem. Hey, you have three yeah. wishes. Your last wish is always for 100 more wishes. Ex that's exactly right. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen, um, and then uh, Jesse will be following along with me, and um, uh, hopefully what we're going to do is I'm, I'll be programming things on my side, he'll be following along with me, and hopefully at the end we'll be showing um, uh, things working on his screen. So um, that's uh, the goal. Okay, and let me share my entire screen. Okay, cool. And I, people can see, I see. Okay. So I have here the node template. We, it's compiling still because uh, I 
<laughs> need to get compiled, but that's, that's fine. It's almost done. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is basically create a new palette. And so there's already this template palette here, but I'm probably just going to change the name of it in order just to make it more uh, more ours. So I'll change it to something like um, uh, Feeless. Why not? Um, that means I'm also going to change some stuff inside of here. Palette Feeless. Um, frame palette template. Uh, so a frame palette uh, for enable. Oh, I should make this a little bit bigger. Oh yeah, I probably should have said that. <laughs> yeah, um, if you yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat right now. So if you, if there's anything that you're, um, uh, I'll try to keep an eye. Yeah, thank you. Just call it out. Same with you, Dan. Please. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Honestly, but, Dan should be used to this already. This is on Dan. <laughs> um, palette for enabling feeless transactions. Um, yeah, we shouldn't need to add anything else here. And then um, I bet you at some point I'm going to have to um, change the dependency imports, but we'll do that at another point. All right, so we have a lib here. We have a mock and test. So right now I'm just going to get rid of the mock and tests because uh, obviously we're just not going to be doing any of that right now. Um, I'll probably just delete it, to be honest. Let's just delete this. What's the worst thing that can happen? Um, I probably, I probably won't be writing tests for this palette, to be honest. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, for the, the reader to take at home. All right. And all this stuff. OK, cool. So um, I'm going to start ripping out some more parts of this logic. Again, you know, the, the template a module has some stuff in here, but uh, we, don't, we don't need this stuff. We're just going to we're going to start writing from scratch. Actually, interesting question. Sean, would you be yes. able to test um, that a transaction is feeless through unit tests, or would you ever do a more integration test type? You can you can definitely test this tr um, feeless, um, trans feeless through unit tests. Um, we could try to look at that um, if we have time at the end. Um, it's, it's not too it's not too hard. Basically, you would um, uh, you would execute the transaction and you would look at the signature returns at the end. Um, yeah, I, I can explain that a little bit more. We get to it. Um, let's go here. Um, okay, so uh, I just deleted the two extrinsics that were already there. We're gonna keep the deposit and error stuff. Um, I'm gonna delete some of these. I mean, you don't have to delete these comments, but I'm just cleaning things up so it's a little easier to see. Um, I'll delete the errors for now. I'll just um, I'll leave a dummy error here, probably just help compile. Um, and then an event. I'll leave a dummy event here just to help things compile too. Oh, actually, I think probably need to use account ID. So dummy account ID. Um, I'm just trying to make things. I'm trying to make things as simple as I can while making things still compile. So this so uses account ID. We'll just use account ID here. Okay, and then um, storage. We'll. I think we can just um, yeah, just leave this. For now, we don't need to edit this. Let's delete these lines, though. OK. Oh, yeah, we should very nice um, helper thing here. We should definitely change the name of our um, storage. Um, this is the this is the prefix that's used whenever generating the um, different storage keys. So I'll just call this feeless. Um, but I, actually, a common error that people have, and we'll probably, we'll probably solve this with the next um, implementation of all the different frame macros, but um, that people copy some palette and start editing it. And don't forget to change this, um, this um, uh, basically this prefix um, string. And then it basically puts all of your storage kind of in the storage of another palette. And it's, it's not really a big problem, but um, definitely probably not what's intended. OK, and let's get rid of this. OK, so my guess right now, OK, and let's hope if I, if I do uh, cargo uh, build um p palette feeless okay i just need to change something here real quick yeah so i think in this in the main cargo toml file of the entire project i just need to change palette slash template to pal palette slash feeless and that joint makes this new file part of my project um fail to read uh, this would probably be in the runtime also you need to change it the cargo toml. No, but I think for now, it's saying that right now it's just this cargo, oh, palace template. Let me just see where else the template shows up. Oh, here we go, palette template. Yeah, so let's just change anything with palette template to palette feeless. Palette template, change it to palette feeless. Hmm. Why do you do this? Let me see. Is there maybe some other place where there's template showing up? Template. Ah, 
here we go. This is the, the part here. So yeah, there's some some other um, yes right here. This needs to be from palette template to palette feelus. This is actually another thing I see a lot of people um, struggle with kind of early on is managing these cargo toml files and managing the errors. Um, I definitely wouldn't say that um, that uh, uh, that Rust is super noob friendly, but I think one of the things that really would help is getting people to be more familiar with kind of handling Rust errors and trying to figure out on their own kind of how they can um, uh, get things working. But I, I don't know if I have I don't know if I have exactly great um, uh, answers for them. Oh, okay, this is causing some issues here. This and then this. Sorry. And then hopefully we'll build now. Yep. Cool. So this is building. Let's assume that it works. Um, so let's kind of just get started, and we'll we'll handle any errors as as they come up. Um, okay, so we're gonna jump back into our feeless palette. Okay, so we basically ripped out everything. It, this palette does nothing. It has no extrinsics, has nothing. Um, but we can um, try to get things uh, working, okay? So we're gonna try to get some functionality here. So what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna have one simple extrinsic and this extrinsic is gonna be called like, maybe like make feeless or something like that. So we'll do um, a new function, make feeless. Um, and of course the first parameter of any extrinsic is always the origin, right? The origin tells us where the call is coming from. Uh, will we be expecting this to be a signed origin? Users will be calling this. Um, but, you know, of course, there are, there are other origins you can check against, um, like root or none. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be a call here. So um, part of um, part of uh, the whole trick here, and th this is a trick we've done in some other places too, um, but uh, basically um, we want this transaction to wrap another transaction. So the, there's going to be one input into this transaction, which will be the other transaction you want to call. So there will be a call, and this will be a box uh, t call. And actually, um, there, there's a few things here we're gonna talk about. So um, uh, first thing we wanna do is here, so this, this t call doesn't exist. And actually this t call probably won't work exactly as I've exactly written it right now. Um, uh, what we actually first need to do is we need to um, define Basically, what are all the calls that are possible in our runtime in this palette? So if you can imagine real quick, this palette can be added to any blockchain with any number of other palettes inside of it, right? So in my palette alone, I can't know what all the possible calls are, right? I don't know if there's a balances palette. I don't know if there's a pseudo palette. I don't know if there's a um, staking or whatever. And so there's some kind of way I need to transfer information from the main runtime. If you look, the main runtime is over here, this runtime source libRS, right? This is where the, the construct runtime is, construct runtime. And this construct runtime here, this has a knowledge of every single palette in your system, right? And as a part of generating in this construct runtime, we generate this call enum. And this call enum basically is it, yeah, enumerates all possible calls across all possible palettes. So one thing you might be familiar with is that this call enum is, is actually quite simple. You know, for, for this very first palette, the call enum, the first um, index will be zero, right? Zero index. And then the, the first call in system would also be zero. And if you want to call it, you know, the third call in system, you would have a, an enum, a call enum with like zero, two. Um, and this basically, this call enum allows you to filter where the what call you want into the correct um, palette and stuff. So this is basically what we call the the, the, the function dispatch or the, the extrinsic dispatch. But it's only at this level do we have an idea of the full calls of the system. So what we actually need to do is we need to, um, to create some kind of um, passing function. We need to pass basically information from the outside of this runtime here into our palette so that we know all the possible calls of our system. So we can you know, basically know what is going to be called. You can see actually this gets, this happens in this pseudo palette. So if you remember, the pseudo palette is, is actually very similar in design to what we'll be doing here. The pseudo palette um, basically allows you to um, take, a, take a call that you would make, and instead of calling it with your origin, the signed origin, you call it with the root origin. And the way that it can know about all the calls is there's this type call equals call. And basically all we're doing here is we're saying there's some associated type in the um, um, pseudo palette, which is a call type. And we're gonna assign that call type equal to the call, which is generated from this construct runtime. And so this call here in white um, actually will be all the calls in your, all the possible calls in your runtime. And we're basically telling this palette, these are all the calls that are available. 
And so a lot of times people, I think, sometimes ask, they ask, like, okay, well, how can I make a specific call to another palette? But I don't want to necessarily have these two palettes be tied together. Well, one of the ways you can do it is basically giving information about your um, about all the available palettes uh, to your um, to your palette. So what we do is basically this call thing. So what we're going to do is actually up here in the trait of this new pal of the new palette we're creating, we're going to have a new type call. And this t call type actually has to have a bunch of um, fancy uh, traits. Uh, actually, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. I think it needs to be like, my guess is parameter um, plus get dispatch info plus something else. Uh, but what we're actually going to do is we're going to cheat a little bit. And I'm just going to go look at substrate. And I'm going um, to take a look at sudo and copy from there. And so this is exactly how I would do it um, if I was working in real life. I, I obviously do not memorize all of these, um, these different uh, traits and stuff myself. But I would just go and, you know, I, I'm familiar enough with Substrate to be able to kind of know where to look for in the code to find the things that I want. Could you uh, also post that in the chat when you, like, go to copy paste it? Of course, of course. Yeah. Awesome. And it shouldn't be bad. So, so again, uh, what I'm doing here is um, I know that sudo has a similar um, design for the core thing that I want. So I'm going to go into the frame. And this is Substrate. I'm going to go into sudo. And if I go to the lib, um, I can see the trait definition in sudo. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, I'm, I'm already getting a little bit of lag on my screen. Hopefully, uh, you all are managing. Um, yeah, you can see here, there's a suitable call, has parameter, um, unfiltered dispatchable, and get dispatch info. I think this unfiltered part actually doesn't need to be there. But um, basically, we're going to copy this. So let me paste it in the chat as well as I, as I can. Um, and of course, you can always find it in um, the thing, in the pseudo palette itself. And so I'm basically going to just copy this here. And this, um, and of course, I'm going to also need to import some things here. So like, I'm going to import this get dispatch info. So I'm going to take a quick look into here, see where it comes from. Or I mean, I can actually, you know, if I just compile, actually, it should, it should start yelling at me about these things. Um, actually, yelling about a few things. So let's, let's actually try to get this compiling as it is right now. OK, so. Uh, Yep. So get dispatch info is not found, but I could import it from use frame support weights get dispatch info. See, that's so simple. Thank you, Rust, for telling me the answer. Okay, and let's try compiling again. And now it's telling me um, unfiltered dispatchable, so I can uh, get that from frame support traits unfiltered dispatchable. And let's try another one. OK, parameter needs it from uh, frame support parameter. And of course, I mean, if you were actually doing this, probably you'd make this a little bit more pretty. Like, you don't have to make a new line for every import, but we're just, we're just going with it. We're just doing it. OK, mixing weight. Oh, this is something, yeah. So every single um, uh, function will need a weight. And we'll actually be using the weight to our advantage later. But for now, I'm just going to put some dummy weight in here. So this is just one of the requirements of frame. I, I actually, I, I hope that soon we'll get rid of this requirement because I think it's not super helpful. It's my opinion. Um, but I'm just going to put a dummy weight here, weight equals zero. That should make that error happy. There should be one more error, yes. Um, this ambiguous call. So this is a great point I want to talk about for all um, newer developers or anything like that, right? So um, I have this call type, and I have to find it right here. No problem, right? And then I say here, okay, well, I want the call type being used here. Um, but it's telling me that this, this call is ambiguous, actually. And it actually it gives me the answer on how to solve the problem. So this is the solution. But I want to I tell you real quick, touch on why this is ambiguous and why it's struggling. Well, one of the things we do when we make a new palette is we always assume that the palette has its own configuration trait, which are the things I've defined here. But it also inherits from the configuration trait from system. You see that here, right? So that my trait always has the um, the configuration traits of system plus whatever I have here. And if I actually quickly go back to substrate and I look at the system palette, you'll see that one of its configuration traits um, is actually also called call. So if I go to um, trait, trait, yes. So if I look, scroll down, here, there's a, here's a call for the system. So basically, if you could almost imagine like this whole list of types that I'm seeing here from the system palette was just copy and pasted into here. And so you might actually have two things that look here that say like, okay, there's the type call twice, 
right? Now you can't actually have type call twice here in this thing, but you can imagine that the Rust compiler, when it sees this T call, it doesn't know if you're talking about um, the call I've defined here or the call defined in frame system. And so basically all I have to do is basically disambiguate which of the two I'm actually using. So one trick I could do is, is change the name here. I could call this, um, you know, my call, right? Instead of call. And if I change this to my call and I change this to my call, this will solve the problem, right? See, um, compile no problem. If, um, if instead I want to keep the name the same, and sometimes you have to, sometimes, you know, you know actually you never have to, but sometimes you just, you know, want to. Um, basically what I have to do is say that, well, T call is not enough to tell the Rust compiler which call type I'm using. Instead, I want to say T uh, as trait call. And what I'm actually doing here is I'm actually doing create trait. So like you don't, you don't actually need to specify create because trait is already in scope here, but I'm using my trait. So I'm, I'm, I have this generic T and I'm, as, I'm using it as my trait and my trait has a call type. And this is enough to disambiguate it. So I think this will be enough to compile. Yep, and it compiles now here. And I think you don't even need this crate because this is already implied when I call trait that there's one trait in scope. And this is enough to, to make it compile. So this is one of those things where there you, have, you have this disambiguation error and this is kind of how you solve it. And this is kind of um, what's what's happening in the background. Um, but anyway, so this, this works. So everything has been compiled so far. Um, um, so now we can actually start writing some more code. Is there any um, questions so far? No? Okay, then I will just keep going. Um, so, okay, so now let's actually start writing some of the logic of our extrinsic, okay? So the first thing we want to do is basically, um, we want to make this be a, um, a sign call. So we're just going to do um, let sender equal ensure signed origin. We know that's uh, pretty normal. Everyone's done that so far, hopefully. Okay, then let's think, okay. Then we actually want to go ahead and dispatch our call. So um, imagine that we made a imagine that we made an extrinsic that does nothing. It actually does nothing, right? All we want to do is basically just forward our call. So this call has these traits, and these traits basically allow us to do different things. Um, parameter allows us to place it as a parameter in our um, extrinsic. So because we can because it's parameter, we can actually place it up here. This, this trait is enough to guarantee that. Um, this actually, we're probably gonna change this trait, but this basically allows us to dispatch the call. So like basically allows us to actually execute this call um, down in our runtime is what this is doing. And then get dispatch info allows us to get things like the weight of the call. So let's take advantage of these traits and kind of why they exist. Actually, if we look right now, actually, my guess is we actually don't need any of these traits right now. Because the only way we're using call right now is actually to have it be just a parameter in this um, in this uh, extrinsic. So if I actually compile it without those other two traits, let's try building it, it should compile just fine. But when I try to use other features of call that I know should exist, this is where saying, okay, well, I, I can't guarantee that this type has that unless you bound it to a certain trait. So um, what, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass the weight of this call into our weight. This is something that, again, if you if you listen to my last time about weights, hopefully you should be familiar with this, but we have this call here. And because our transaction, our extrinsic is not gonna do anything besides just execute this call, we can just pass the weights forward. So I'll have here weight equals um, call dot get uh, dispatch info dot weight. I think that's how that is. Or maybe it's just dispatch info. I have to remember. Maybe it's just dispatch info. And let's see what happens here. And it's probably going to complain this doesn't exist. Right. Yep, this 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 um dispatch info does not exist. So let's instead try. Oh, I actually I might need to let's try to add that um, one trait that I knew we need. We need this um plus get dispatch info. So this is where this trait comes in. And let's see what it starts yelling at me about. Oh, not found in box. Okay, so probably I need to like um, unwrap this thing. So maybe if I put a pointer here, or if not, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna get cheat real quick and look at um, sudo. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna look at sudo, see what they're doing here. So in sudo, we do the same thing. We, we wanna get the, the, the weight of the call. And so in sudo, where's the declare module? 
Oh, this is uh, the wrong one. This is system sudo. Here we go. Yeah, here. So it's call dot get dispatch info. So I, I lied. It, it, I was a real. I, I shouldn't have doubted myself. It's not get dispatch. It's get dispatch info. Okay. And this should and this function should exist because I had that trait. I don't need this pointer. All right, cool. It compiled. So let me, let me just do one more thing real quick. So I wanted to show you. So this get dispatch info, this function exists on this call type because we've constrained this call type to have this trait, get dispatch info. And of course, we can go we can go into substrate and look at this trait. Um, I'll just do that really quickly. I probably won't do this for everything, but just to get just to really paint a picture here. So if I search in substrate, the main substrate about trait, get dispatch info, you'll see here it shows up. And you can see here that anything that has this trait has this function get dispatch info. So as, as long as it, something is bounded to this trait, we know this function exists. And this get dispatch info will return a dispatch info struct. And the dispatch info struct is defined here. And this struct has three things, weight, class, and pays. So we could get extract from it whatever information we want um, uh, from that call. And 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 this um, this um, whole get dispatch info this whole implementation of this dispatch info information is all automatically generated for you in the um, um, declare module. So part of the reason why we have these weight traits and all that kind of stuff is all basically we construct on the fly this um, these trait implementations for you. So these macros do a lot of magic for you um, to make it happen. But you can see if we don't if we don't constrain this call to this trait, I try to compile this. It will tell me I, I I can't I can't access this function. We don't know that this function exists, right? So it's only when I have this trait that this happens. Okay, so that is that. And so basically here, what I'm, I've done is I've forwarded the weight information to the weight information here. If I want to be more specific, actually, I probably should um, forward the weight information. The um, uh, actually, I listen this. Let's do it a little bit more fancy here. So what I can do actually is um, say uh, let dispatch info equal call get dispatch info right and then i can say that the and then uh, basically i return a tuple and the first part of this tuple will be the weight so i'll say dispatch info dot weight is the first one then dispatch info dot uh what is it called um class is the second one and then dispatch info dot uh, pays fee. Oops, dot pays fee. And so basically here I'm passing into my weight exactly the same information that's coming from the call that we are that we were going to make. Let's build this. Oh, doesn't like it. Missing closing delimiter. Oh yeah, I forgot to put a closing bracket here. Sorry. You can see here in this weight, we can actually write a small basically like closure type thing, right? We're just writing a small function here. We just make a temporary variable and then we just pass in all the things. Okay. So that's the first part. The second part, this is this just basically makes sure that our, our weight information is correct. The second part is that we want to actually dispatch this call. So um, this extrinsic for now is not going to do anything. It's just going to forward the call to make, actually make it happen. So we have this call and this call, you can actually call call.dispatch. Dispatch. And part of dispatch will be the origin, which you want to make the call happen. So um, I will have to do here, uh, let's think, what is the thing? I should be, um, I think it's just origin again. And that should be enough. And I think that's, that. so this won't work because I haven't specified that the, the um, trait for dispatch, but let me just see what's happening here, yep. So dispatch is not yet found in this um, call type. And so in order to be able to use this dispatch function, of course, we need to add another trait, which was that um, uh, unfiltered dispatchable. So let me go ahead and copy that back into my um, runtime. I had chat actually, right? Lots of things happening here. OK. By the way, if there, if there are any questions, you know, yeah. definitely start forwarding. Yeah, I repost it for you. OK, cool. Um, so let's see if this works. I think that. Let's see, dispatch. Uh, I think I think actually I need to change this. So there's a, there's a few. Th this one is a little bit harder for me to explain. This is something that um, Guillaume introduced. But um, unfiltered dispatchable is a way for you to be able to basically forward a call um, without having any filters that exist applied to that call. So you might, for example, have a proxy, and a proxy has a filter on which calls it can make. 
What you don't want is, is some other um, logic later in your code to actually pass um, that extrinsic and then remove the filters. Because you want to make sure that you know if a user has certain filters applied to them, that those filters stay always there. So I think what I actually want is just the, actually the trait just dispatchable. And dispatchable alone, I think, will allow me to basically keep the filters around and just dispatch the calls. So let me see if this works. If not, Probably then I'm going to have to think a little bit harder. Or dispatchable. Yeah, okay, but there's no there's no dispatchable in traits. So let me let me see if I can figure out um what the right trait I want is. So I think there's a trait. Let me search unfiltered trait un what was it called? Yeah, unfiltered dispatchable. Is that not a trait? Here we go. Trait unfiltered dispatchable. Okay. So here, so this unfiltered dispatchable has this function, dispatch bypass filter. What I want is a function dispatch. Let me just search this then. And I'm gonna be finding where this thing exists. I, I'm surprised it's not in the same file. Yeah, pub trait dispatchable. Okay, so it's it's located somewhere different. That's also weird. This is these are I would I would have put these two things in the file. But here, here here's the, the trait I'm looking for. So pub trait dispatchable. It's in primitives runtime. So I'm gonna basically make sure I import that one. So use um, sp that's substrate primitives runtime traits dispatchable. Okay, this is so when I'm looking at at this thing, I see primitives runtime traits. I know to import sp for primitives runtime traits dispatchable. And then this function, so let me change this unfiltered dispatch to dispatch. This um, this trait gives me access to the function dispatch, which actually dispatches the call and returns the result of it. And every single call um, that's generated using declare, declare module um, becomes dispatchable. That's why that's, that's why all of these um, extrinsics inside of the, the module are called dispatches. Because as a part of this declare module, we actually implement this dispatch trait onto, onto the um, extrinsics. So that's that's where this is coming from. So dispatchable. And then um, because of that, I should be able to call this dispatch function. So let me see if this compiles or not, if it yells at me. Okay. You're going to have to, in the cargo tunnel, put SD runtime into dependencies. Yeah, that standard. makes perfect sense. Yep. So we didn't use SP runtime before. So now we need to do it. Yeah. So this is so right now SP runtime is in the dev dependencies. So this will only be accessible through tests. So what I want to do is actually move it into the normal dependencies. So it's available also um, in uh, um, in the normal compilation. Also, I need to make sure to add here SP runtime STD so that when I use STD um, features on my palette, that it's also pulling in the SP runtime STD feature. This is a very common mistake that people make. So I moved it from dead dependencies to dependencies and then added the second line here. And so let's compile this now. OK, some other errors. That's fine. OK, that, this is all, all good. So I think um, I was trying to cheat some stuff here, but I think what I can do here is um, let result equal this. I'm probably not going to use result for now. And then that's it. So let's see if this compiles. What happens? Oh, and then origin. So probably I just need to do origin.clone here. So I'm using origin twice. Origin doesn't implement co um, copy, so I need to do clone. OK, great. And this all is working for me. Is it compiling for you? Uh, yeah, looks good. OK, cool. So if we were to actually just take this, now I actually, I should be able to do this question mark thing. I wonder why it's not working. I mean, I, what I expect is I should be able to, oh yeah, I should just do question mark with a quote, semicolon at the end. And basically this will um, propagate up any okay or error to here. So if there was an error in this dispatch, this um, make feel list would be an error too. Um, oh, let me see what's happening here. Um, huh. Couldn't convert to dispatch error. Let's see what, let's me look at the trait real quick. So this returns dispatch error with info. Okay, so there's probably some conversion thing bobber happening here. Um, what I can do, okay, I, I, I'm going to solve this later. Um, I think it can be solved pre pretty easily, but I think it's going to be solved automatically with some of the stuff we're going to be doing later. But for now, I just going to have a result. And right now, this function will never return error. That's not great, but um, it's, it should be fine. Um, okay, so uh, basically what we're going to do, what this, what this function does right now, it does something. If you were to run, compile this and, and execute it, 
you could basically trigger any extrinsic, just um, instead of calling it through this function instead of calling it directly. And that's, I guess, a little bit annoying. This kind of serves no purpose. There's no reason to do this. Uh, but this is an example of um, of how basically you do that. Basically, I've just forwarded the call here, right? Oh, Actually, by the way, Sean, I think we yes. have some answers from yeah um, people in the chat. But if you write the return type explicitly, you should be able to. Uh, if I if I specifically return um, a dispatch result. I should be able to do it. I, at some point, this actually this is going to change. Actually, this 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 return type, and this is actually one of the things that is kind of interesting. It can um, it can be the return type can be quite flexible actually, because we're actually going to be doing dispatch result with post info. But I wonder if this will solve it. So there's no dispatch results. Yeah. So I need to import sp runtime dispatch results. Nope. Let me just do that real quick. Use sp runtime dispatch results. Let's see if this actually does solve it. Oh, and I need to, of course, if you, um, so this is, this is actually another thing I hate about the macros that if you um, introduce this actual return type, you actually have to introduce the okay at the end. If you don't have the return type, you actually don't need okay. These are things that hopefully will all be removed with the new set of macros. Okay. Uh, can convert to the yeah, dispatch error. So I, th I think, I think the problem here is that I, that this dispatch result needs to actually be something more like dispatch result with post info. Um, if we're, and if we're going to do it, let's just do it with post info. Is similar. Okay, let's just try with info. Mm, expect the one type argument. Okay. I'm not going to walk down this rabbit hole, y'all. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to keep moving forward because I think that this is all going to be solved when I actually use the the this special post info. Okay. Um, but uh, just to note that this exists. Let result equal. And let's just get rid of this line again. Um, okay, cool. So uh, okay, so this is working. Um, we have uh, somebody that just basically forwards a call. Um, so what was I saying? I was saying, um, you know, there, there are some things I could actually imagine some some reasons you might want to do this. Like, you know, you can imagine adding some kind of trick here. Like, if you wanted to emit an event or you wanted to like allow a user to like um, to to add some additional information with their call, you could do you can make you can make a function like um, you know add um, note, and there would be a call plus um, a note, which is a vec u8, and then you could have something like you know. Um, you know, emit event like you know, deposit uh, event, uh, you know, uh, raw event noted with the note or something like that. So, so, so something crazy, like that, right? So you could have something where basically every time a user makes this call, you could um, emit an event with a note about this call, and this could say like you can give context. This, I mean, these are fun little functions. Of course, you could do the same thing here with a batch. You could batch remark plus um, the call you want, but you can imagine there are some uses for a for a setup like this. But um, what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to go a little deeper now, and we're actually going to go play around with the fee systems. Okay. So, um, what I will say is this: when um, when we dispatch this call, this alone is not actually integrating any of the fees stuff. So when you call call dispatch, it alone doesn't do any fee thing. You're just executing some arbitrary logic. It's just doing it, right? The fee stuff is actually happening from this weight stuff and some of the background logic that's happening, which takes care of this weight. So you can see here, actually, um, um, what we've decided to do really quickly to just set things up is we've, we've set the weight of this function, of the function we have, to be the weight of the call. The class, so this could be like whether it's a normal, operational, or mandatory extrinsic. In most cases, it's just normal. Um, the class is coming from this dispatch as well. And the dispatch pays fee is coming from this as well. So if this um, call is supposed to pay a fee, then our function will pay a fee. If this call does not pay a fee, we won't pay a fee. You can actually, um, we can we just make this a little bit more explicit. We can actually, for now, we can just assume everything always pays a fee. So we can, we can have here pays equals yes. And I think um, I need to import pays. Let's see if it tells me where to import it from. Nope, it doesn't help me. So let me, let me, let me find where pays is. I think pays is part of um, the weight stuff. Oops. 
uh, I think it's going to call it enum pays. Yes, so this is in frame support weights. There's an enum pays. So let me go and add that real quick. Use uh, frame support weights pays. Okay, and now it works. So you can see here, instead of instead of inheriting the pays from this call, I'm saying always here, pays is yes. So now the trick, this is one of the features that Substrate has, is that actually you can, um, um, well, I mean, you can, in your extrinsic, change what the final configuration of this weight is. So this weight that you're seeing up here is the upfront weight. This weight, there's a, again, if you if you saw my last talk, you probably know some information already. But this weight has to be very lightweight to um, to calculate. So and has to be basically assumptive of the worst case scenario. Um, but um, we but the actual weight of the call underneath this function may actually be dependent on the logic, right? You can have imagine there's some kind of statement. There's a you know if um, you know if uh, you know uh, path one, then, uh, you know, do something super expensive. And then the other one is, you know, else, um, do something super cheap. So what we need to do in our weight definition, actually, for this weight info up here, would actually be, um, basically to, you know, the, like the weight of something expensive, right? We have to assume up at the front, that this that your um, function will always be doing the most expensive path of your of your logic, but it's possible that you actually do something much cheaper. And so what we can actually do is take advantage of this thing called wait refunds. And wait refunds will allow you basically um, at the end of the call to tell the um, the runtime how much weight was actually used, and then not only return weight to your system, so allow your blockchain to do more things, but actually return the fees as well. So um, what we'll do to be able to enable access to this is we actually will have explicit return type. And the return type that we'll explicitly use is called um, dispatch result with post info. OK? Um, so um, and maybe just, I'll give, go a quick second. So the, the uh, normal dispatch result type is just dispatch result. And basically, we've defined some other types which are kind of fancy, and they kind of wrap things and have other logic, um, which allows us to include additional post information with our um, with our uh, uh, extrinsic. And what this will allow me to do is allow me to actually specify at the end some new weight. So I can imagine some say let's say like um, let new weight equals um, the old weight, which is um, this call get dispatch info dot weight plus let's say a hundred right we can do something crazy like that and then I can actually return okay I think I can just return new weight something like that um but I'll have to check the syntax exactly but some something like this ish might work so let me see if I can get things compiling of course I'm, I don't remember everything off the top of my head but we'll just get things working so here this batch result with post info is a real type we need to import it from here use frame support dispatch dispatch result with post info okay so let's do that real quick. Cool. OK, and then um, it's expecting something different. So I think um, it, I can't just pass new weight directly. I think I need to pass, um, uh, uh, wrap it into an object like this. To a little tuple? Nope. Something like that. OK, so let me, let me, let me, what I'm going to do is look up the definition of the dispatch result with post info. And let's see what. Um, what I see. So again, a good practice for everyone. You know, if you're if you're trying to remember how all this stuff works, you can either look at the documentation or even better, just look at the source code and figure out what's going on. Um, I might actually even just look at um, another palette to see how they implemented it. So here, so here you can see a hint as to what we're going to do. I'm going to look at um, somewhere else. Staking. Okay. So staking. Um, at the end, there are adjustments. And adjustments is returning. What am I doing here? Give me a second. Dispatch result plus info. 
Oh, this is super not helpful. Let's look at um, something, another function. I think maybe I need to just pass like sum. I mean, I just need to wrap it in sum. Dispatch. Yeah, I think I should do some actual weight. Okay, uh, I, I'm pretty confident here. So basically, um, uh, if you have a dispatch with post info, um, you can either pass it some new information or no new information. Um, and let's see if this compiles. Uh, close, closer. Post dispatch info. Uh, people are saying dot into might need uh, to. Be... Yes, all the fancy some dot into. So there's there there are there are some um some like from and to implementations that take advantage of these things. Okay, yeah, this is working, and I need to basically clone this and call dot clone. Mm -hmm. I'm using call twice here. I mean, we probably won't do that long. Yes. Okay. Dot into. So basically, this is a lot of a lot of um Rust magic too. But basically, what what I expect when I see this is that there is probably some um, bigger struct that's being passed in here. So if if this line would probably more explicitly be written something like, okay, um, post dispatch info, which is probably a struct, and post dispatch probably has like weight, and I would say you know like you know this new weight, and like you know um uh up like you know uh class like basically I, I would i would at the very end um define redefine all of the stuff so here i would say like you know, like old class whatever the old class was something like that right and but this can be a little bit verbose if you want to write every time so probably someone wrote an implementation which says well um if if we have you know um a option uh wait um we can convert it so it's probably someone someone wrote somewhere impl uh, from option wait to post dispatch info and wrote some implementation which basically says, okay, well, if I pass this option wait, I can call into and it will convert it into this struct. And I actually, I bet we can, we, you know, if we want to look real quick, we can we can find that. Um, and I probably will. But for now, let me just do, oh, let me just go back. Now, let me just delete all this stuff. But this is why um, we're able to do some tricks. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a good way to kind of know, like, I don't know if you, people can just know this. I think you just have to either see the documentation or you have to um, look in the code really deeply. But like all of these tricks with how you can do things more simply is, is maybe not super, super clear. But let me, let me see if I can find this real quick. So if I find um, uh, impl from option wait, ah, see, look at this. It's exactly what I expect, right? Impl from option wait for post dispatch info. It takes the actual weight, which is this, you know, this option weight, and basically it creates a post dispatch info with the actual weight and pays fee. So this is exactly what we're doing. So we've 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 simplified it a little bit. So instead of having to write this struct every time, you can just pass just some weight. And you can actually see here there are two things we can modify in the post dispatch info. We can modify the actual weight and we can modify the pays fee. And this is a a, a big hint as to what we're going to be doing to be able to remove fees from our system. Okay. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if anyone in chat, um, anyone more experienced Rust developer, has any hints as to kind of like how can people find all of these tricks? Like, I, I don't. It's not. It's not obvious to me. But um, yeah, and if someone, in, someone, some Rust gods in chat. All right. So this, um, this, so this works. So basically, what we're doing here is we're we're allowing us to define at the end a new weight. So actually, this is a really bad example because one of the rules with um, with um, defining the post weight info is that remember that this weight up here is the worst case scenario. We can't actually increase the weight in this post dispatch info. So this plus one hundred makes no sense. Actually, this will not do anything. It will not increase the weight by hundred. Will not increase the fees. You cannot increase the fees after the fact. That the weight system user is up front in the transaction queue is checked whether or not they are able to satisfy all the requirements of the transaction. So if a user needs $100 to be able to submit the transaction, we check in the transaction queue, does that user have $100? Imagine the user has exactly $100. And then we have something that says, okay, well, the weight is actually more. We actually want to charge more fee. We can't take from the user more than they already have. And we can't like undo the execution. We already did the execution, right? Like this increasing of weight is not logical. This is exactly why our weights have to always be upfront, the most expensive op the most expensive it possibly could be in our extrinsic. And then what we are allowed to do is actually decrease the weight. So I can actually do what makes more sense here is minus 100. And what this will do is actually free up 100 weight and, and reduce the transaction fees by whatever 100 weight would be. 
but it, if you were to add a plus sign here, it, it wouldn't complain an error, but actually you would notice that your weight would not actually change, that no fees would actually change here. That's the logic inside of the code. So only minus makes sense here. Okay, so that's something important. Okay, but we're not gonna actually modify the weight here. What we're actually gonna do is modify the pays fee. So what I can do, um, I'm gonna get rid of this, all this new weight stuff, is as a part of this dispatch result with post info, assuming everything finishes okay, I can actually here return sum pays no. So at the beginning, I assume this extrinsic will pay a fee. I execute everything. There probably should be some checks here. So, I'd be, you know, so sanity checks that things should work, work, right? Should work. Um, something like that. And then um, assuming everything does work, um, at the end, we can say, okay, at the end, well, no, this user is not going to pay any fees. Everything was working correctly. They don't have to pay any fees. And I think that this, this um, syntax should work. Let's see, what did I mess up here? Maybe I don't need some. Maybe I just need to do pays no. Pays no dot into. Let's see what this does. Yep, OK, pays no dot into. So this is it. So now this extrinsic now would actually be a way for a user. Oh, I should change this back to make fee list, right? Make fee list. Um, this, this extrinsic now, make fee list, would basically allow user to make any call fee list. That they can basically call any call. Um, we don't check that the call is successful right now. Well, we will later. And basically at the end, make it so they don't pay any fees. So this right here is a is a is a DOS attack into your <laughs> blockchain. But uh, but basically it allows anyone to make any calls to your um to your blockchain without paying fees. And this is the the, the root of, of the trick that we're gonna do here. So now what we actually need to make this usable is actually add some additional logic. Things like, okay, let's have it so the user only can um, make so many free transactions per time period, right? And we're going to go and implement that logic. So if there's any questions, um, now would be a good time to chime in if there was anything. But if not, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, yeah, I'm not <laughs> compiling yeah. anymore. <laughs> there's a lot of questions here. Yeah, I do. Okay, some of these things I think are things I'll answer at the end. Yeah, so why use box? So I think I think it's um it's that the uh, there's probably some, probably Rust probably better, but I think that like the, um that the the memory size management whatever box is uh is more manageable. I think that a call itself doesn't have um uh the right properties and needs to be inside of a parameter. But maybe someone else can answer this a little better than me. I actually don't hundred percent know. It's a good question though. Possible to access the T call parameters within wrapper make feeless. Um, oh yeah, so you're you're asking for what are the parameters of the call type. Um, I think I think it is possible, but I'm not sure if we actually expose any any um, any functions which actually do that. That's a good question too. I don't know if, if we expose anything to that, but it would it would be hard it would be hard in general to write to write any code which does this. So so the question is basically if I have a call and the call is like transfer balance. In the balance transfer, there's parameters like the first parameter might be like who to send it to, the second parameter might be how much you want to send, all that kind of stuff, right? It would be hard in general to, to really make use of those parameters because um, in the way I've written T call, it could be any call. So the first parameter for balance transfer could be who it's sending it to, but then the call could also be like a democracy vote. And then the first parameter is, a, is a something completely different, right? So it wouldn't really be possible for you to write logic that manages or uses the parameter types. In the, in the in the situation where you want to access the parameters, you probably want to hard code which calls you want to interact with. And in that case, um, you definitely can access it, but it wouldn't be through this generic T call. So I, I'm pretty sure we don't expose any way for you to get the parameters of a, a generic T call because there's there's no way to really know or deal with, with the types and what they are and all that kind of stuff. So so I think the answer in general is no, actually. Um, but if you want to do something like this, like if you want to make like that all transfers, which are more than a hundred tokens is free, you could do that. But the way you would do it actually is not by using this generic call type, but by hard coding your palette to be working with the balances palette. So it would be like, you know, uh, palette balances trait, and then you'd be able to um, you know, check like you know, um, you know the do you be able to basically to directly check is this call is the call coming in or whatever directly a balances call, 
and then you'd be able to look at the parameters of the balances call. I think that that would work, but um, it wouldn't work in gener in a generic form. Okay. Let's see. Grief, uh, the counselor, collator, reward decrease over time. Okay, this is something later. Polka dot contact. Okay, they got that. Assign weights to a non dispatchable function. Is it possible to assign weights to a non dispatchable function? So I know that off like um, uh, off chain workers, I think also have weights. I think, um, it, but I, I think this this question is a little bit um, and it needs more context. Um, definitely for for here to post more, but like in, in in general, what the weights are used for is to manage resources on the blockchain. And um, what we mostly care about is you know how does the users from the outside cause resources to be you know, consumed on your blockchain. So it really makes sense mostly for dispatchable functions. Like it's kind of mostly how it's designed, but if you want to elaborate more, probably we can answer that. But um, weights in general is a much more generic concept. Like it's just like, you know, how much time does it take to do something? So you definitely could use it in other places, but um, yeah, in the context of um, our uh, frame system, it's all the weight stuff is happening over dispatchables. Okay, so uh, we'll move forward. So now we're going to add some logic. So the logic we're going to add is a user can do um, some number of free transactions per time period, okay? So to do that, we're gonna have some kind of tracker. So we'll have some kind of like, um, let's call it tracker, I guess, tracker. Um, I don't need a getter right now. So the tracker will be from an account ID. So it'll be a map, map. Um, oh no, a map has all the slot, this syntax now. Okay, map, um, I think it's uh, hasher um, 2x128. Uh, oh, 2x concat, concat128. We'll see if, if that's correct. Um, T account ID. So this is from a user to some kind of lookup. And the lookup, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, be a little bit tricky here. Um, uh, and I'll explain more logic later. But it's going to actually have um, to be a tuple of two things. It's going to be the uh, current... Um, index, I don't know, or like what I want to call it, like current index, I just call it index, and then um, count. Um, and I'll just make some quick types here. So type index is going to be a U32, and type count is going to be a U32. So um, I don't know the best way to explain it. So I'm just going to try my best to explain it now. Kind of, I have some foresight because I thought about this problem. Why we want to do this. So a naive implementation might be something simple like this. Might just be a user has a count, right? So as we go ahead and um, and uh, a user makes calls here, we just increment the count. And well, let's actually let's just let's try this. Let's 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 walk through what this might look like. The more the more naive example, um, and and figure out why this isn't necessarily the right solution. So one thing we can do here, so we have we have make view list, sender makes a call. The first thing we want to do is basically um, check that the user can make a call. So it means we also have somewhere have to um, do like a max call. So let's just make a new storage item. Um, max calls, which is going to be a count. Um, and this count is, will, will have a default to 100. I think this will work. Uh, let's see. Nope. What is what's happened? Oh, two x concat. Okay, so two x sixty four concat. So two x. Let's do this. Sixty four concat. Okay, I think that's fine for account ID. And this should be a equal sign. Sorry. Okay, so um, basically first, let's get the let's get the max count. So uh, let um, max uh, count equals max or max calls. Sorry, max calls equals max calls get. Um, and then we can also say um, let user calls equals uh, tracker get of the user, which is sender. We can borrow. Okay. And then we want to basically ensure that okay, well, um, if, uh, or we can do an ensure statement here, ensure um, max calls, uh, user calls, ensure user calls is less than max calls, right? 
or else we can return an error, error, a t, um, uh, uh, what we want to say like, uh, no free calls, sure, something like that. And this obviously add an error here, no free calls, and this will be user has used all of their free calls. Okay, so let's see. This should work. Um, and then, of course, you know, if um, if this passes, then we can do um, uh, tracker um, insert uh, sender and user calls that saturating add one. Something like that, right? Let's see what else did I mess up? Insure, there's no insure in this thing. So insure comes from frame support, I think. Mm -hmm. And tracker get, so Oh, because I need to get T. Sorry, tracker needs this generic T parameter because um, it uses uh, T account ID. Okay, so this should work. Mm. Oh, of course, tracker needs T here too. Sorry. Okay, cool. Um, okay, this is basic, right? So. You should have a max number of calls. Um, I made a decision here, um, and it can be whatever you want, that the max calls here is a storage item. So making it a storage item is kind of nice because then you can imagine like governance. We can make some extrinsic which allows governance to change the storage items like at any time. So you could basically dynamically adjust how many max calls users should be able to make. Um, another option could be to actually have it up here as a configuration trait. Like if I was building this for Polkadot, I'd probably put it up here. Um, type max calls. And it'll be a get of like you know u32, um, and uh, or I guess it would be count whatever. Um, and this would allow me basically to configure it in the runtime. Um, it would make it slightly harder to to edit it. In order to edit it, you couldn't just do like an extrinsic. You'd actually have to do a full runtime upgrade to change this um, to change this parameter. But what this would do is actually would save you from having to do one extra storage read every single time that this function is called. Now probably. This is not a big deal because um, imagine that um, you know everyone uses this function um, once per block. This storage item will actually be read, and so it's really not that inefficient to have it this way. But you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, if, like how often will you really change the, you know, the max calls? And if it's not very often, then probably it's better that you just do it here. Does that make sense? It's kind of the choice between having a storage item and a configuration trait. So like storage item, it will cost you a storage read. Configuration trait is totally free. It's just like a hard coded variable, um, but how freely you can modify it is not you know it can change. Um, one thing that is important is to make sure to initialize this count. So I have here the default is hundred. This is kind of important. If you don't initialize it, then um, it'll default to zero on a new chain. Um, other thing you can do here is you can you can add a config, which allows users to specify in Genesis what the max call should be. But um, that's a little bit more advanced. It's a little tricky. We don't need to do that right now. Okay. So this basic logic will work. Okay. So um, the problem with this logic, though, is that um, at a certain point, the user will hit the max calls, and we don't have any logic that resets it, right? We want to reset it every n number of blocks, right? So um, this is where um, I will actually um, uh, introduce some reset logic. So in order to reset it, I need to add like a, um, like a session. So there'll be a session, and it'll tell me which um, chunk of blocks I'm in. Let me see. Let me think. Let me, let me think of what I want to do. I want to do, yeah, session. Um, which will be some kind of um, uh, index, right? Some it will be this u32, um, and it'll start at zero, and then um, session length, which will also be, which will be a block number, um, t block number. How long um, a session will be, and this we can set by default to be like a, a thousand, right? I think that I need to actually. Um, do something like um, 1000 dot into something like that. Let's see if this compiles. Okay, yep, this compiles. Um, and so uh, what we want to do is we want to 
um, check um, what what block it is, what session it is, and reset the uh, the count every single time the user hits a certain um, hits this hits the um, the next session. But the, this this is where um, the kind of the 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 problem comes with. Uh, uh, resetting this user count. So one thing we could do is have some function like on initialize, right? So we could do it. We have a function here, function on initialize, which the input of on initialize is the um, is the block number. So like now is t block number, and what we could do is every single block check, you know, um, if now. Um, but I'm deleting this, so you don't have to follow along if this is. If, this is, if, um, if now a uh, mod, uh, oh, I need to get this session length, right? So I'll get uh, let session length equals session length get. If now mod session length equals zero, then I could, this is the nasty part. Uh, oh, I have to remove all the counts of all the users. So actually, in this case, I wouldn't even need the session of here. I would just session length, and then I would have like tracker uh, t remove all or something like that, right? Now this is a very short line, but this line is is crazy. Oh my god, never do this. Never, never, never do this. Okay, I I, I wonder actually. Let me see. If this will compile. I think this will compile. Must return a wait. Okay, session must return a wait. So let's do wait. Yeah, because uninitialize always also has a wait. And for now, we'll just do zero. Uh, what else here? Associate tape on enter. So this is supposed to be a block number. So um, I'll turn um, a zero into a block number just by calling into. And wait is not found in the scope. Okay, so let me just import wait real quick. We're gonna need it anyway later, probably. Okay, um, but basically what I'm doing here is that um, at the, at whenever a new session for like you know when we want to give everyone free transactions, we would delete all the storage of all the um, block session length. T. Um, but this is really crap because imagine your blockchain has like a million users. This remove all statement would actually be deleting a million storage items. Like that is crazy, right? That is a lot of work, and you'd be and it's potentially doing this every thousand blocks or whatever. Like this is this is some crazy operation. This is not a very good way to approach managing um, uh, tracking of these of these um, of these calls. If it got big enough, would you randomly see like block times on every thousand call just start to increase? Just for oh, one block, hundred percent. You will, you'll see. You'll if, if it gets big enough, you'll absolutely see block times that that won't even happen um, in the right amount of time. Like they'll be like you know, um, if you have a six second block time, it'll be like you know, twelve seconds, fifteen seconds, however long you know the delete thing is. So so this is so this is maybe a naive solution. This is the wrong approach, but it would work. It would work. But it, this is the wrong approach. What I would propose instead is by just increasing your storage a little bit more by basically giving users an index comma count, I can actually track what the last index we counted for them was. And if the current session matches the index of the of, of, of the thing we're counting. So let me, it's a little hard to explain uh, with my uh, awesome dic dictation here, but um, let, me, let me just write it out and we can see what happened here. But you imagine a, a tracker actually tracks an index and a count. So here in the tracker, we'll actually get, um, um, current session comma user calls that will be a tuple being returned from this get um and then uh and then so what we want to do right now is so what is the current session so we want to get the current block number so let current block number equals as we always get this from this from the system palette so frame system module t um, block number. It's just something you should something you just know after working with Substrate enough. Um, and then um, I can get the current uh, session. So um, let current session equals current block number divided by session length. And of course, I need to get session length too. 
let um, session length equals uh, session length get. Actually, session length should probably be a block number two at this point, because we're going to be doing mathematical interactions. So this should be T. So this is another thing that people run into a lot. So um, here I have um, session as index U32. People are asking me, okay, well, how do I convert my block number to U32 and all kinds of stuff? So actually, what I would say is you should, you should um, as much as you can, work within the same types, because session is only interacting with block numbers and session length. Um, we can just make session a block number. And um, whatever type the user defines as the block number, we can just use it. So I don't actually think we need this index. This can also be a block number T block number. <clears throat> so we don't need this index at all. Index is just block number. Um, so here we have, yeah, the current block number, the session length, and then the current session will be the current block number by session length, right? And this, of course, um, is integer math, so it'll just um, uh, remove any of the floating point numbers. So um, if the current, if the session length is 1,000 and I'm on block number 4,000, the current session is 4. If I'm on block number 4,500, the current session is still 4. If I'm on, on block number 5,000, the session is 5, right? This math makes sense, right? So then what we want to do is check. Okay, well, we have the current, we, oh, so I can't put current session twice. Let me see, um, current, let me see, let's put last user session, uh, last user session, sorry. Can't use current session twice. So the last user session was this number that we have tracked, and the current session is this. So first thing you want to check is, well, if the last user session is less than the current session, then we can just reset the user calls. User calls equals zero. Right? Let me make sure, let me just think real quick. So if the last user session is less than the current session. We reset the calls, right? So um, in this case, if the user called the last session and has already a bunch of calls uh, managed up, but now we're on the new session, we can basically ignore whatever count we have in storage and instead just reset it to zero. And if the current session matches what we have in storage, we'd actually just increment the count. So I think this logic makes sense to me. User calls equals zero. So this probably means I need to make this mute, right? So that mute. Um, okay, and then, then we check, okay, after we potentially reset the user calls, then we can check, does the user calls, is it less than max calls? Um, if not, there's no free calls available. And then we input by taking the user calls, which was zero, if potentially zero, and then adding one to it. So I think this is what I want to do. I'll have to put mute there. The traits go connect method for U32. Oh, probably saturating add dot into. And it's not implemented for. Oh, sorry. The tracker now inserts two things, right? So I can't just insert just um, the block number, but I have to, inter I have to insert the, the current session plus the um, number of calls. So this is the user calls. Let me format it a little bit nicer. Uh, and so it'll be two things. The first one will be the current session, right? So this is what we have, the current session. This is the last time we tracked this user, and this is how many calls we tracked of that user in that current session, right? That makes sense. Okay, we don't need this. Session length. Okay, I forgot to put a T now in session length. Anyway, if anyone if anyone feels better about the number of errors I hit when I program, then I'm happy for you. To, I'm I'm not afraid to show you just kind of my fumbling around. Okay, and everything compiles. Okay, I think this logic is right. I, I'm gonna look at chat real quick to make sure that someone tells me there isn't something obvious. You also don't need the session storage item. I don't need session storage item. Oh yeah, I don't need session storage because I'm I'm just um I'm just calculating that on the fly. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Alex. What else? Anything else? Is everything else looking good? The logic? Pile into Google. Yep. Um, any other any other logic problems? I think there's no logic problems here. But I, I, hopefully you can see how this slightly different way of approaching tracking the count is infinitely better. Because at any point I'm only editing one um, one storage item, and I'm not going and deleting you know a thousand million storage items, whatever every single um, 
uh, yeah, block. Okay, it's looking good. Good. All right. I think this is the uh, most of, most of the basics. So actually, the last thing I want to solve is um, let's think. So um, a few things to note about here. Okay. So there's really only one check we have here. This ensure check, right? So, can the user make the calls that they um, number of calls that they they should make? Um, so, uh, we need to think about exactly what the what will happen when um, the logic executes, right? So, if this statement fails, right? They have no free calls. This this um, return statement that pays equals no will never be reached. And so this user will actually charge the full fee, even though nothing nothing was executed, because we never we never checked this. So we can actually make this logic a little bit better here, right? We can make it so that this user, if this check doesn't pass, that they are being charged a lesser fee. So let's 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 make this more advanced. So this ensure statement is not as flexible as I want. What I want is let's think. How do I want to do this? I want to have some weight, some some weight returned if um, this logic passes, and some weight returned if this logic doesn't pass. Okay, so let's let's try this. So I'll do instead of an ensure statement here. What I will do is I'll make sure this function can always be. Well, actually, actually, we should think. Let me, let me, get, let me get some feedback from you. So, what do you think is the? What do you think should be the thing here? So, if a user doesn't have any feeless. Um, transactions. You should this call still execute, and we take a fee, or should we just not do anything? I think it makes sense not to do anything, right? Like I don't think it would be good if the user would expect that they made a free transaction and instead we actually took some fees from them, right? That would not, that would be a bad that would be well, a bad here's, behavior. Here's a question. Um, mm -hmm. Just personally, I don't know on Polkadot, but I know on Ethereum, if you send a call that hits a revert statement or an insure statement, would be the equivalent. You still lose the gas, or you yeah, still you pay the fee. Yes, and 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 here you should still pay some fee. But I'm thinking is that what we shouldn't do is if the user doesn't have any free calls, we shouldn't actually execute the actual call. We should only make them pay a fee for what this this basic checkup logic is, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's what we should do. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is let's get rid of this ensure statement. We should do a little programming on the fly. I didn't really think too hard about this one actually. Um, let's put an if statement here. So um, if user calls is less than max calls. This is what we want. If this is if this is actually true, then we will go ahead and do this logic. We will update the the the, the tracker logic, and we will actually dispatch the call. Else, we can actually just here return okay, um, and we can say and uh, I'll just define some weight. Let's say let's say um, let um, um, but I want to say, um, check, wait, check logic, wait, I don't know. I should make up some number here. I'm gonna make up, you know, make it, um, uh, T D B wait, get dot reads. And how many reads do I do? I do one, two. Three, do three reads. I mean, this is this is not actually how you would obviously write benchmarking and do all that stuff. But I'm just gonna write some kind of basic sandy logic, and then I'll return okay some check logic weight, and then otherwise this can return up here. Okay, pays none. So here we'll, we'll have a, a different return statement for each one. So if the user could make max calls, we'll return pays no. Else, we have some other weight, which is at the weight of doing these storage reads. And um, uh, we'll return that. So let's see what this yells at me about. Oh, did I forget a closing bracket? No, that didn't sound right. That's strange. A closing bracket. Nope, it's looking right to me. Wait a minute. Oh, let me just check some. Okay. 
Yo, what? What's happening? Let me. <laughs> I, I somehow I literally. Oh, oh, oh ah, here. Okay, great. <laughs> not not going crazy. Okay, great. Um, and oh yeah, into. This needs my into. Cool. Okay, so this this makes a lot more sense, right? So this function is always callable. The worst case situation is a user charges, it gets charged for doing um, three storage reads. Um, that's the worst case scenario. That they don't have enough calls, they get charged for this three storage read, right? Mm -hmm. The um, the the best case scenario is that they don't pay any fees. Okay. Uh, and this and this generally this generally feels right. Let me think. I had some other logic I was thinking about. Um, and then probably we want to, um, we have this result here. So we have to do call dispatch. And probably what we want to do is actually return some kind of event um, with the dispatch results. So we can have, um, so this dummy, we can say, you know, um, uh, just call it result. No, the results, we can't use the word result. Um, let's say uh, extrinsic result, extrinsic result. And we'll say a candy is user who called, and then a uh, result type, I think would be enough. Or I think we have to go to dispatch result. Dispatch result. I think something like that. Can we just do bull and say, hey, you did. Good or false. Yeah, yeah, but I think you, it's good to have dispatch result because it can return the error. Like you can get the specific error message that the error would have happened, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and so then we can do here um, uh, deposit event, a self deposit event. Um, raw event t uh, extrinsic result um, sender. Probably I need to doc clone somewhere. Okay, that's fine. Do it for now. Sender and um, result, and I might get some. I might get some the result con conversion problems again here. Raw event, not from event. We don't need this T. Yeah. So this dispatch result. So I need to bring this to the scope. This one. Expected found associated type. Um, maybe it's maybe not. The, maybe, I want, maybe I want the special post info instead. So let me just try that real quick with post info because that's probably what this thing returns post dispatch info what is the return type of this thing we can return remove the parentheses man I, it's, it's pretty silly actually I, I don't so this so this function dispatch we can go back into our into our docs so I want to find fn dispatch It's in this here. It returns a dispatch result with info. And dispatch result with info. I feel like there's just like some I need to, to call like dot into or something like that. Let me see if I can if I can do that. Result dot into. And let's go back to this thing. Sorry, I'm I'm, a little, I'm, I'm just kind of Trying to make the compiler happy. Dispatch result. I'm going to import it again. Hmm. That's really stupid. Ah, for some reason, I can't get this. Okay, well, I, I guess I guess we, for now we can do the bool. I, I, hundred percent, you can definitely pass the result. Oh, okay. Actually, actually, look at sudo. I think sudo has 
um, a solution to this. But I mean, hundred percent, you can you can definitely once you figure out what the right types you need are, um, pass what you what what I expect to get through. Let me take a look what sudo does. So sudo has this uh, event or is decal event. So decal event it returns a dispatch result. Okay, so dispatch result. And then in order to do the dispatch result, it just does it. Call into, oh, so the result matches to true or false. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Oh, this is a different one. This is pseudo has done. Okay, that's a weird one. So let's look at this one. Um, deposit event. So I need to look for the deposit event for sudid. So that's probably the very first sudid. All right, pseudo. Deposit event sudid. Oh, res map. Okay. Uh, this is what we have to do. We have to just add this. Basically, we're, we're going to map uh, success to the empty and pass the error forward. Yeah, and feel free to drop that in the chat for, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie got it there. I mean, I, you know, to be honest, though, I, you know, I, I knew this was an option, but I thought I thought you could do a little more friendly than that. Like, it does, it's a little bit unfriendly to me to to force the user to do something like that. Um, but OK, we will we'll just do uh, what it wants me to do. OK, so result. So, so we need to, so if result is OK, we map. Um, that to be okay, or just this. Otherwise, uh, oops. Dot map error. E. What was it? E dot, e dot error. error. Yeah, e dot error. And then let's make sure everything else. Yep. Okay, that compiled. That was good. Oh, and then I have more if. See, I was just doing some JavaScript actually this weekend, so this is where. Yeah, always... <laughs> we can tell what the if we yeah, have. I was gonna. Yeah, say exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, so at this point, I think actually I'm pretty happy to have you compile and try this. Um, yeah, I'm actually pretty close to compiling. This last thing, I'm slightly not. Do you mind just scrolling down a bit? Uh, this chapter was always posting for. Yeah. Sorry, just after this uh, event, I ran into an error. Um, I did one argument. Sorry. So the, the, did you put did you put two um, in your extrinsic result? Did you have both the ascender and the result? Uh, yeah, I have ascender and a result, and it says expected one argument. Know, in, in, in your definition, did you yeah. put account ID and dispatch result? Let's see here. Account ID and, yeah, dispatch result. Yes, I have both. And result sender result dot map uh, maybe it's a different error uh, no it's... you know maybe maybe at this point you want to yeah. you can just share your screen too we can maybe look at your stuff or yeah absolutely That's and i'll also i'll start building on my slide just in case um yeah I'm, i should just be one like small thing away from it anyways. Uh, oh, I probably need to update my runtime. So yeah, I, I, I want to do cargo build release. I, mean, I want to build a runtime that has this palette in it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. It's um, cargo plus nightly. I don't remember what the plus nightly is. Let me see if I can just go up. Oh, I think I just missed a closing delimiter. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Uh, Self deposit. Let's see. I got this. Cannot infer. Mm -hmm. Type for parameter t. Nope, that's okay. Cool. I'm good. By the way, I just oh. missed the closing bracket. Yes, and I need, and I need to import box, which is interesting. Probably for the no std. Actually, I would expect there's actually another way to import this. Probably better. Um, and should I wait, or do you want me to add this to my runtime? Um, yeah, you should you should try to get the whole thing compiled now. So right now I'm just going through yeah. and I'm just compiling the whole thing. Um, and you can see that like some some parts where I have palette template, 
I just need to change the palette feelers. Um, import the feelers palette. Um, and then probably some other parts I need to just update. Yeah. From the palette feelers. So here I need to add my call type. Type call equals call. And let's see. Probably down here in the construct runtime, I should name this feelers. Feelers. Palette. Feelers. Mm -hmm. Call probably storage. Yeah, I think yeah. In general, the box stuff. Yeah, you're right. I think I would I would import it in SP SD Prelude. That has all the basic stuff like um, box vec, all those things. But I mean, if this if they explode somewhere else, I'm just gonna import it. Okay, looks like it's gonna compile. Um, I'm gonna be looking at chat now. If there's any questions, if there's any um, just a call. Cool. Then I should be able to build. The... Were the concerns with implementing a feeless transaction system in production? I think we we answered this one already. But um. Basically, like, you, you, the main risk is DOS attacks. So if you allow users to do things on your blockchain without paying fees, um, and there's a vulnerability, basically you allow attackers to basically um, spam your chain without any repercussions. And no fees means they're not paying any. They're not paying anything to do these attacks. So that leaves you open to um, really nasty um, DOS attacks on your system. So you have to be really careful about this. Like um, even even this system we built here. Um, is 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 reasonably vulnerable to attacks. Um, what I would say is that, like you know, if you want to make this better, probably um, you'd want to check that a user has a certain balance to even allow them to get this permission. And I might even adjust how many free calls each user can make based on how many how much balance they have. So, like a user with like a million dollars can make more, and a user with less money can make less. And this would um, be preventative against civil attacks, where um, basically you'd have like one user make a bunch of small accounts and then give them all a thousand free transactions. And then we also talked about the other attack where um, users could transfer balances between accounts, right? So like the way you can get around this is basically making the last call a free call to transfer your funds to another account and then make a thousand more free calls, right? This is the the the, the, the genie attack. We'll uh, we'll coin the term, <laughs> and you can actually solve this pretty pretty quickly. Um, I, I, I probably don't want to add it here because I'm afraid that the logic might not be super sound. But you'd imagine adding somewhere here. Um, some maybe some kind of like um maybe a different extrinsic i'd imagine extrinsic like fn um a lock balance and this would be something the user has to call first to kind of join the fila system and then we would have a list of users who, um, somewhere who who have locked their balance okay and then the logic in it would be to like you know like lock um you know um all tokens um for the rest of the session right and then there would be like a fn unlock balance origin and so basically you know if, if our session is small enough in time um then you know users shouldn't feel that much pain about locking it for that period of time and basically locking all the tokens for that period of time would allow them to um to uh uh make sure we don't transfer so th this has its, this itself has its own problems because um uh, because if a user locks their whole balance, then um, they can't transfer anything, right? Like they won't be able to call a transfer for free, for example. So maybe you don't want to lock all the tokens. Maybe you'll lock some threshold of tokens, which you you feel safe to be civil resistant. I mean, there's there's, there's logic here again. It's depend on everyone's blockchain on on what you want to do, but you you have to kind of define to yourself the right logic, which will support a kind of a safe system. Right um, now, yeah. this system is still is still under is still attackable. And by the way, uh, safety is important too. Um, also, UX might be considered important. You know, we're thinking about users right now as individuals, but whoever builds on blockchain knows that sometimes they need to build systems that send transactions automatically. So, you know, somebody who's doing that would have to check to make sure that their transaction actually went through and they actually got a free transaction. And if they hit their limit, then to resend it again, a pay transaction. So, um, I, I think all of that could be really easily wrapped in a in a simple JS library. Like um, again, you take Polkadot yeah. JS and just add an extra function, and the function would do this check into this into this palette to see if you have enough fieldless transactions. And if you don't, then it would not submit it fieldless, or it would return an error or something. Right? That's yeah. the UX can definitely handle that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so compiled for me. 
Um, oh yeah, have... it's, I'm on eight ten of eight eleven. It's about to compile in like a cool. few minutes, a few seconds. So that was that <laughs> was that question. What do I? How do I mark these as answered? I think you need to be the admin. Oh, which one? Just do start answering and then done answering. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, why does Kind of Polkadot not have this kind of thing in more places? So it, basically, um, uh, we did add it to Solomon Polkadot. So I, I personally added this feature um, to make it so that um, uploading those um, those wasm blobs would be uh, free. And also, we added it to sudo, so that sudo transactions are also free. Uh, also, question, when I went to go, or when yeah. person X, <laughs> shouldn't say me, I went to go claim their dots that they got from the dot tracker token. Mm. Was that a feeless transaction? Because I don't know how I would have paid gas. Yeah, that. that was that was a feeless transaction too. And we can talk we can talk about it and look at that. Um, but um, in general, what I would say is this that it, it's not super trivial to add this logic everywhere because you have to add the correct checks to make sure that it's not abusable. So the next place this will be added, and there's actually an issue open for this. So if someone wants to tackle it, um, the next place to, um, to add this would actually be to um, um, have council their first vote be feeless. So council, they've already been um, nominated into the position or they've already been like, you know, voted into the position. Um, there's a few, there's a very limited number of council members and they all have this task where they need to do votes and votes actually right now cost them feet. So it's, 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 it's something that's not super great. Um, so what we actually wanna do is we wanna make it so that the, that the first vote for a council member is free. So that doing their job is free. But it's not abusable. We don't want to make every vote free because every vote being free, then a single council member could just spam votes for the entire block and really take down the chain. But um, if there are 12 council members and we say that each first vote is free, then at most we, we allow for a um, number of council members times number of proposals times one um, free transactions. And this is a, a very well bounded number, which we can say, okay, well, Polkadot can definitely handle this kind of bandwidth, right? So the, so we need to have logic like this in other places to enable more free fee, fee or fee list transactions on some in Polkadot. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm running my yeah. blockchain now. Great. Uh, so why don't you share a screen and we can we, oh, I can walk I think through some I of the UI stuff. I'm sharing my screen, but you might need to stop sharing your screen okay. for it to like take. Let me close you know. video. Okay. I. Oh, uh, please close hover to hide. Can, so can you guys see my screen then? I can see. Yeah, I can see. Uh, yep, I can see your screen. Awesome. So why don't you open up um, uh, a browser and go to polka.js apps. Uh, yeah. And then there, you might need to add one type. You might need to add the type um, count yeah. equals U32. Oh, cool. That's it. Um, yeah, let me get my Brave, which is somewhere up here. Uh, sorry, I've been fighting oh, make it bigger. battery make problem. Focus screen. Where's my Brave? Yeah, it's better, better, Alex? Okay. Okay, I guess I'm doing Google Chrome. So yeah. Uh, yep, that's right. App. Oh right, uh, this one. Yep. And then make sure you go to the yeah development. Mm -hmm, local node. Yep, and switch. Cool. And now I need to go to settings. Right, I need to add in that. Developer. Mm -hmm. For the count. Uh, uh, I think it has to be, I, I think you have to do it like object format. So cap, yeah, parentheses, capital C count. Mm -hmm. And then parentheses, or yeah, quotes uh, U32. And save. And you always have to refresh this page, which is something that I have <laughs> learned yeah. the hard way. <laughs> okay, so let's try something real quick. Let's go. Uh, let's actually go to your accounts. I, I want to see the balances of users. So let's go to accounts. Uh, yeah, um, I'm worried that you're gonna. Yeah, that's that. Um, Maybe you can open a new private window if you don't want to yeah, show all that, those. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I should have done. Uh, oops. <laughs> no problem. Cool, and then I'm gonna to have to do all this again. Uh, development, local node, switch, settings. Um, and I'm pretty sure the Polkadot.js was fixed so that I don't have to add the two extra things in that, right? Uh, I don't know. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll find, find out, out soon enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what I would do is, so these balances are not very easy to see, like 
feeling stuff happened with, I think. So let's let's transfer to Charlie exactly like um one one thousand units. Charlie one thousand. Okay, so Charlie has exactly 1,000 units now. Okay, so now let's let's try something. Let's go to the uh, developer extrinsics. Feelis. Mm -hmm. um, okay, make Feelis call. So now we're going to do a balance transfer. That sounds good. So um, uh, you so change using selected account to Charlie. Right. And then let's send from Charlie to let's say Dave. I don't know whoever doesn't matter. And let's mm -hmm. send exactly 100 units. Let's see what happens. So we should now have 900 units exactly. Yeah. You, you, yeah, open that in a new tab. Yeah, 900 units exactly. Perfect. So now let's, now let's do a basic transfer. So you can just stay on this page and click, stay on this page and click send. Mm -hmm. And let's send Charlie David and send another 100 units. And now we'll have some fraction lower than 800. Has that? Yeah. Seven, nine, seven. Oh, you can let see. me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can see exactly this. So we we, we call the fee list. Um, we set exactly how much. We didn't spend any fees, but now we did a normal transaction, and we we see you see there's a little bit taken away because we spent some fees there. And that's just and that, that's the general idea, right? We just have this, and then um, of course you know probably it's not super friendly to test the other behaviors like a thousand transactions every thousand blocks, whatever. But um, mm -hmm. you can write some unit tests to check the other logic, but you can see how we kind of gated this um ability this feature against um some basic logic which tracks the things maybe, maybe we could do actually like go into the um, to the storage um and you can look at the chain state and you can see that we've tracked the user's um count it would be in the fee list right yep and max calls or yep. yeah no, well, actually, if you call max, max calls, i think it will return zero or no, no return 100 return. because nice. that's hard coded okay. yeah cool cool um tracker, tracker account id and account id on charlie should be one. Yep. Yeah. And then if For we look at Dave. zero, we have one. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Dave or something. It should be zero, zero. Yep. So that's that's the basics of um of everything here. Um yeah, I I uh, so so a good question you asked was this, uh, the feeless transaction related to um claiming, right? So um and then also this this ties into a question that Dan asked at the very beginning of the thing related to signed extensions. So uh, what we did here is a very basic feeless transaction example type thing. What the, the advantages of this approach is it doesn't modify in any heavy way frame or substrate, right? But as I mentioned, um, you could take the ideas introduced here and definitely make them a lot more robust and a lot more integrated into your blockchain if that's what you want. But in order to do that, you would have to um, basically um, go and actually pro probably touch and edit a lot of the palettes or make your own palettes or make your own, you know, like setup on your blockchain, which is a little bit more work, but not super great for um, kind of friendly introduction. Um, some of the, some, if you do go down that route, there's a lot more kind of more powerful things you can do. And um, one of the things you can do is this um, signed extension stuff. So if you actually, if you want to close your screen, I think. Um, yeah, is that the close video button at the top? I'm, oh, wait, yeah, I stopped there. There we go. I think I got can. It. No, yeah, I got okay. it. Got Let it. me see if I can share my screen again now. Let's see if we can take a quick look at the logic around um, claiming tokens um, in Polkadot. So I'm going to open up Polkadot. Um, it's, it's not work on. Let's see the other my other Polkadot. Cool. Repository open Visual Studio Code. And you can see, you see my screen, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go to um, FN claim. Yes. Oh, Docker. That's thank you. Not now. All right. So, how does claim work? So absolutely, you're right. That claim is something where it was a fearless transaction, and you, um, you as someone who didn't have any tokens before, couldn't have made that claim, right? So how how did it work? So, um, let's see here. Process claim, mint claim. Give me one second. Let me just take a quick look at this code. Yeah, so 
you'll see, so if you see my screen, that this claim actually has a different insure statement. It's not insure signed, it's insure none. Insure none, kind of by definition, can't take fees, right? Like, um, uh, you, don't, you don't see here, for example, pays equals no, but you don't need to see it because when you see insure none, there is no fees being taken because we can't take from anyone. There is no, there is no um, account associated here, right? So uh, this already tells us that this is a fee-less transaction, and it, but using a different method. So how how does insure none work, and how how is this safe? Well, one thing you know is that insure none basically has no check on the origin. The origin is coming from from anywhere, so it can be completely an unsigned transaction which means that this could be totally abused. This function could be totally abused. Someone could just spam it a million times with, a, with no origin, all that kind of stuff. So how do we prevent this? What we do is actually a signed extension. So before we actually get to executing this logic and actually running things in the runtime, every single blockchain has a transaction pool. And the transaction pool can have a hook into the runtime for these signed extensions where we can do a special check to verify whether or not a transaction is even valid. Before it actually gets put into the block, we can check in the queue if it's valid or not, okay? So um, if we scroll down, 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 I'm gonna see some extensions here. See signed extensions for pre-validated tests and other stuff like that. Um, but I'm gonna find one that says a signed extension for claim here. Validate unsigned, okay, for claim. Um, and you can see here that we have different logic for each uh, for each person. So um, if the call, so this is a hook that's being called in the transaction pool. If the call is to claim, the first thing we do is we check whether or not the signature provided in the claim, so the claim has two parameters, an account and a signature, an Ethereum signature. We check whether that Ethereum signature matches the data that we expect. If you remember when you when you signed the message to claim your tokens, you actually just had to sign a special string. You had to sign like, I am this user, I'm claiming my tokens, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, um, we check that the information being provided, the data being provided matches that, that signature for that Ethereum account. That's the first check that's happening here. Then we check um, that the claims actually um, exists for this user, that this sender actually has a claim in our system. And then we check, um, yeah, the, the, um, I guess here there's another check, that the, the, the final statement actually matches the statement that we signed. So like we check that the signature is correct and we also check that the statement that's being signed is actually correct. And if all of these checks are correct, if the, if the user signed the message correctly, as we expected, the user has um, some claim to be had in our storage and the user signed this correct message, then we say that the transaction is okay, that, the, that it's a valid transaction. If at any point one of these checks fails, you see we return invalid transaction, right? The invalid statement, signer has no claim, it's an invalid call, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if any of these invalid transactions um, get triggered, then the transaction pool will never even include the transaction in the block. It'll actually throw it out of the transaction pool. And more importantly, it won't even forward this transaction to other blockchains. So um, it, it kind of ends there. So let me make a very clear statement here that, th that this pre-check doesn't stop DOS attacks on a node, that there is some node that is still doing um, a signature signing verification here, which is an expensive operation. It's still doing storage read operations, all this kind of stuff to, to validate this transaction. So if you ex ex have a node and you expose an RPC endpoint where users, users can send transactions to your RPC and spam it, this is how they could potentially take your node down. But what this protects is your whole network from being DOSed. Because th if this node is doing the correct thing, this node will not be forwarding this transaction to other nodes saying that, hey, this is a valid thing. And let's say that this is a this is a malicious node and it is forwarding transactions. Then the next node should be doing the right thing and not forwarding transactions there, right? At some point, there should be a cutoff from who is forwarding these malicious transactions, right? And of course, there's probably some logic in the networking or other stuff to you know, drop peers that are sending you lots of bad transactions, or there should be some, um, um, some firewalls that you have or proxies or whatever, some, some system you have to protect your chain from from getting these bad transactions. But this is the, the basically we have some logic ahead of time 
But forward, if he gets it to the block, which checks whether or not the transaction is valid. And if we have this check, we know for fact there's only a finite number of, of such transactions that these can also be feeless. Now, what's important for both this um, transaction and the one that we created is that it being feeless does not the same thing as it being weightless. So remember, weight is a, is a calculation of how much time it takes to do an operation. We have not in this function, if you look at the claim, claim still has, where is up here, a weight associated with it. So there's that executing this function still costs weight. You can only do so many of these calls in one block. At a certain point, the block will be full. We can't add more. Important. In our um, palette, we also still have a weight. Our weight is still the weight of the call we're making. Actually, we should probably increase our weight to be plus, you know, three reads, right? Because um, we add three additional reads to everything. But, but our function still has a weight. Just because we don't pay a fee doesn't mean it doesn't have a weight. So that means there's still a limit to number of transactions you can make using this method. But you can make it feeless. So um, your user doesn't pay a fee, but the blocks are still limited in size. So there isn't um, an attack in this system to you know spam blocks to make them too big because the weight system is still managing correctly how many transactions can fit inside of one block. Does that does that all make sense? Uh, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I actually answered some questions that I was coming up with like, hey, wouldn't you just forward all these calls? But no, it's cool to know that the node level stops it. Um, exactly. And at that point, like just web two protection of your endpoints, you know, yeah. rate limiting, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not a great person to talk to about um about um adding the right protections to your um to your uh, um node, but that's the kind of the thing. So what is a signed extension? So a signed extension is basically yeah, just um it says it's a set of um, extensions you can add to your runtime. Where um, which um, allows you to access the call before it's being dispatched. I mean, it, it can actually do a lot of things, so it's, it's kind of hard to give it a, a short summary. But sign extensions can do um, things like you know, like like um, verify that. Okay, I mean, it's probably best to just look at sign extensions for a for a blockchain. So if we go to um, the node template and we go to the to the runtime, we'll see here somewhere extensions. I think. Yeah, signed extra. And here are a bunch of signed extensions which are added to every single node template. So here we have things like check spec version, check transaction version, check genesis. So these are things that verify the transaction being sent to your blockchain are meant to be for your blockchain. For example, um, you will note that in the transaction you send in the payload, we will encode in it special information about the genesis of the blockchain that it's targeting. And so that if you get a transaction sent to Polkadot, you cannot replay that transaction on Kusama because the genesis of Polkadot and Kusama are different. Even though basically Polkadot and Kusama are basically the same blockchain, almost, you know, in a lot of ways they're the same, you cannot replay the transaction across the two because this check genesis would fail. Uh, because WebAssembly, like, especially if they're not compiled on the same machine, right? Because WebAssembly would compile differently on different machines. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, um, so you'd always have a different uh, that blob and, in the config file. Yeah, exactly. That and the spec version would be different. The like, any any of these things could be different. Yeah, but ultimately, right. yeah, your, your your genesis hash would be different. And this is what this this check is doing. So this is some of the things you can sign extensions. You also have check error. So checking error is um is um the way that we check that um, a transaction has gone stale. So um as you might know that there's lifetime for transactions. So transactions um that are submitted, um, uh after a certain amount of time will expire and cannot be used again. This is again to also stop replay attacks, right? On the same blockchain. Because so yeah, it, um, with the existential, existential deposit, um, you could actually fall out of the state tree, reset your NOS, and then have all your transactions replayed without this, which I accidentally did a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's exactly right. So, <laughs> oh, so, so the check error makes it says that, okay, with my transaction, this transaction is valid for this error. And if the error passes, then um, it's no longer valid. So the transaction can't be replayed later. Um, check weight. This is the logic which actually checks that the, um, the the weight will fit inside the blockchain, and then transaction payment. This is actually the the logic that will actually charge the the, the fees in the transaction payment. So actually, we can take a look at that because this is relevant to the, what we've done here. But basically, signed extensions is a bunch of extra additional logic you can add to your blockchain, which kind of um, it happens you know before the actual dispatch. It's, it's all happening kind of beforehand. And there's actually a few hooks inside it. The, um, the signed extensions also support hooks at the end of the block as well. 
Um, so it's a little bit hard to explain in general, but if you look at more in definition of the sound extensions, you'll see all the hooks you, are, you have available to you. But these are kind of generic extensions to your runtime. So maybe we can take a quick look at one of the, what one of the sound extensions look like. We'll go to, I'm in Substrate again. So we're going to go to um, Transaction Payment. And then we're going to look at, hopefully, the signed extension in here, which does charge transaction payment. So uh, let me find it. Charge transaction payment. Yeah. Here. Yeah. So implement signed extension for charge transaction payment. And so what this will do is at the beginning, at the, before any call actually happens, we validate the call, right? And to validate the call, we check um, whether or not we can withdraw the appropriate fee from the user. This is what we, the withdraw fee is doing here. So we know that the we know the weight of the of the of the call. We know how much um, weight should convert to fee. So the very first thing we do before we even are able to put the transaction and execute it, we try to withdraw the fee from the user. Right, um, and then yeah, this is what's happening. In, so this is in happening the validation logic. Then, um, so this is just to validate that, it, that it's allowed. Then there's a pre-dispatch logic. This is the logic that happens exactly before dispatch happens. This is where we actually withdraw the fee. Okay, so you see, we kind of do the same thing twice here. But this is where the fee actually is getting withdrawn. And then there's a post-dispatch hook. Post-dispatch hook is something we do at the end of the dispatch. And this is where we actually return the fee, compute the actual fee. So here we took the upfront fee. This is where we took the, the largest fee possible. And then we calculate what the actual fee would be. So if you returned some weight, we return some of the, the actual fee. Or if we say pay equals no, then the compute actual fee would be zero. And then we correct and return the fee to the user that we didn't need. So you can see assigned extension in some sense is basically just a bunch of hooks throughout the block execution process for each transaction. So you know, here we have um, some validation logic, which happens in the transaction pool, some pre-dispatch logic, which happens right before you're dispatching the actual transaction, and some post-dispatch logic. And you can write signed extensions for any of your pallets to add additional logic before and after, or even the transaction pool for, for your, um, for your um, extrinsics and, and your pallets. So as an example here, um, could I do something like put an off-chain worker on a post-dispatch call? So, you know, as I call um, transfer, maybe I check a blacklist or a block list um, after into the different database? So I, I don't think that would work because an, because an off-chain worker is specifically an asynchronous type of operation, right? So. Ooh. Um, and not only that, I, I don't think off-chain workers, off-chain workers themselves have their own pipeline for execution. So um, I, I'm, the, the logic in this dispatch, log, this validate pre-dispatch post-dispatch, should I, as, as far as I understand, follow the rules of like consensus, like needs to be deterministic type stuff, whereas exactly. off-chain workers aren't, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you could do things in here, um, like, yeah, you could look up a whitelist of users or blacklist of users um, in, uh, in some deterministic storage in your runtime and then check, are these users even allowed to call my chain? Something like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a pretty advanced topic. I mean, it would be great for me to have another seminar on just this topic in general. But um, this is something that is, is quite advanced. One thing to note is that um, uh, when you make a, a new um, signed extension, you'll have to edit your runtime to include that signed extension. And it's potentially possible that, that this could also be breaking changes. So it's not, it's, not, it's not free necessarily to just add new random logic. Um, it depends exactly on what you're doing, but this is kind of um, things you have to be worried about. Okay. So let's, we've answered this one. Okay. I'm going to just go through some more questions if there's any more. How and why would you grief a user that abuses the Felix transactions? How and why would you grief a user that abuses Felix transactions? That doesn't really quite make sense to me, Will, but um, in, does it make sense to you? I'm gonna, you wanna um, I mean, I could see a couple questions kind of being asked, but I think the most Logical one would be maybe within the chains uh, itself be like, hey, somebody keeps doing, and we can tell that they're using a feedless transaction too many times. Um, yeah. How would you attack that? I would want to charge them the fee. Mm -hmm. if, if I knew they were abusing it, just charge them the fee. Right, but um, it's, it would be hard because, you know, it, it's okay. if, if somebody starts abusing your feedless transaction system, it means that your system is flawed because it can be abused, right? Um, 
uh, it, within our system that we designed, you could do things like reduce the number of free transactions. Like if you're noticing there's too many transactions happening on your network, it could be that you can't support a thousand free transactions. You know, you can only support 10 or whatever, right? And so this is, these are the kind of facts. Or you might want to increase the requirements to be able to get free transactions. But um, if it's being abused, it means that you need to change the, the, the logic or the parameters of your, of your system so that it can't, so it's not abusable. Um, it's supposed to access T parameters within, yes, yeah, so we answered this already, the, the parameters of the call. So um, as I mentioned, you can't do that generically really. So as a validator, collator rewards decrease over time. Is there a way to have revenue going to block producers without making the end user get hit with fees? Okay, so you're saying, so you're saying that, um, yeah, so like at some point, a lot of chains, they determine on fees being the ultimate source of revenue for collators and validators. So what you could do basically is that if a, you could add some logic where wherever there is someone doing a fee-less transaction, you could like um, generate the equivalent amount of fee and give it to the block producer or something like, something like that. So oh. this would be charging with inflation, which is actually kind of charging everybody um, equally. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So I, now there could be abuses in that system too, but um, you have to I, I have to think harder about it. But you know, it, you as a block as a runtime engineer. You could literally uh, invent, you could literally have a button that says, give me money, right? So you, you could print money as much as you want. So um, in terms of how your your economic model is going to match like paying um, validators um, with fees and stuff like that over time, um, it's up, kind of up to you, but it's definitely possible. And there's definitely a million ways you can um, generate new tokens and new fees for users. Yeah, I mean, I'd be careful of an attack of a block producer um, realizing that they can make more money if they just start calling all these fee-less transactions themselves with different counts. Yeah. So, definitely. Okay. Often my dispatchables use the same internal function. So I'm calculating the same internal weight for multiple dispatchables. It would be cool to have weighted function combinator. So a new function to be created with assigned weights by construction. It would be cool to have weighted function combinators that new functions can be created with assigned weights by construction. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I think I might understand that a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong, but pretty much, let's say if I make a call that's like, um, I don't know, try to mutate something, and I'm using that call generically in multiple different functions, um, instead of having to individually calculate that weight each time, maybe I can just calculate on like a sub function and say, any um, call to this function, just add that weight on without me having to rewrite it multiple times. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, I, I think, it sounds doable. It sounds like something you have to do more macro magic, right? Like end of the day, what we need is we need to we need to have somewhere where we we add up all the weights for our dispatch so we can know how much the the, the max weight would be. So, I, th I think what you're describing sounds doable, like where you just have um, each sub function have its own weight and somehow like it just automatically knows that above. But um, end of the day, it's like you know, it's like the magic you're describing is somewhat is needs to be coded somewhere. So. Um, our um, macros currently don't support it. Um, you could, of course, extend these macros um, yourself and support these kinds of things. But um, it's, I think it's a little bit more complex. I think, I think what you're saying sounds trivial in expression, but it's complex to implement. It's quite, quite complex to implement. So I'm, I'm not sure if you'll see this anytime in the near future. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an idea. I mean, it definitely, it's it definitely, I think it is doable. So let's see. Okay, polka dot contact. Is it possible to assign weights non special functions? Yeah, I yeah, I think Alex is generally correct that you can you can you can assign a weight to anything. How exactly, um, yeah, how exactly you want to manage that weight and deal with it, you have to do within the bounds of what the our frame macros expect. Yeah, and I think this might relate to the other one of if he has a bunch of like sub functions that he's just calling common functions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's it. I think that's um that's that's pretty much everything I want to talk about. We we have a, a solid two hours here on on stream. Uh, I seem I seem to love uh, my time here. Um, does anyone else have any? I'm just gonna pause for a good minute and ask if there's any more questions for people who are still in chat. By the way, a lot of people really want that hooks thing, and I want that hooks lesson too. So um, definitely, definitely something yeah. we should consider doing in the future. Yes, yeah, sending extensions are, are are quite quite powerful. To be honest, though, I, it's it's my opinion from my understanding, I haven't used any extensions a lot. I have used it, but I haven't used it a lot. Is that they're really not super friendly. I think it's that they're not in the they're not in the limelight. Um, so uh, you know, use, people don't use them very much, and so the, the, it's kind of quite unfriendly to use. And there's also this 
um, signed extension versus validate unsigned, which I'm actually even I don't even know exactly the, the distinction. Um, a good person to talk to about this would actually be um, Thomas. Uh, I think Thomas is the last person to really touch this code kind of heavily. So maybe he can also um, get on maybe with me and we can we can do it together. But um, yeah, it's it, it's definitely an interesting um, advanced topic for sure. Okay, Guillaume was here. That's cool. Guillaume was here. Okay, any more questions? Um, hopefully, uh, okay. I don't really see anything else. Um, I hopefully everyone found this um, super educational. Um, uh, we saw it working, so at least um, this is something that you could. This is something that you could um, try to tweak yourself and put onto your own blockchain. If you do, uh, let us know. Uh, we'll take a we can take a look at it. Make sure there's nothing obviously wrong. But um, yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so much on for that. That was fantastic. Yeah, thanks for following along, Jesse. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun. Okay, cool. Then I'm gonna end the stream here, and um, yeah, I'll see you all uh, next time around. Oh, it would be interesting to talk about transaction payment in a non-native currencies. Yeah, so this is this, so this is an interesting topic. I think it's something that we could talk about soon because we're actually working on a pallet right now in Substrate, which would manage um, non-native currencies. Um, that being said, at the moment, um, Polkadot, Kusama, Substrate, Frame. We, we have not yet ourselves kind of delved into the non-native currency thing. Like, you know, the, the multi-token DeFi world is something that's not really something we've uh, we've touched yet. And as a result, we haven't needed to build these end-to-end -end systems um, into our own runtime. So I wouldn't be the best person to talk about. Like someone like um, the, or, the ORML guys, like Akala um, people, they, they would be someone to talk to because we've actually um, accepted a few of their PRs, which adjusted our... Um, systems to support non-native currencies, and so they have, as long as far as I know, implemented something like this working. But um, they would be better to present, not not to say I. But hopefully, in the future, when we have this new a new palette in, and we actually do look at trying to implement um, some alternative fee systems things, we can talk about that here. But I would say that in general, um, it seems like non-native token fee stuff is very complex and dependent on your blockchain. So I would think just off the top of my head, a minimum requirement to support non-native tokens um, being used as fees is you would need to know a basic co conversion factor between every non-native token and the native token, right? Because yeah. the whole point about fees is that fees should cost some amount of money. It should cost the user some money. And most chains don't have don't know how much money the token actually costs. Like we don't know on Polkadot how much a Polkadot token is worth. What we do know that the that the fee adjusts automatically based off of game theory. It adjusts automatically based off of um, the um, uh, the activity in the network. And we know that when in the you know in the real world, if the price of a token goes up, the cost of transactions go up, and then therefore the number of transactions that happen go down. And this is kind of one of those mechanisms that it happens kind of off chain and the blockchain itself doesn't really need to ever know about it, right? Yeah, so, I'm like I'm personally in the camp that if you want to introduce a shit ton of risk to your uh blockchain or system, just require that you need off chain data. <laughs> because that's gonna add in a lot, a lot of risk overhead. Right. Yeah. I mean I, I think so like a system like this would need an Oracle. We need some kind of Oracle or need some kind of some some system to convert between converting these things. Like um, it may not even need an Oracle, actually something like um uh, Uniswap might work because Uniswap has these like self-sustaining um, conversion models which tell you the price difference between any two tokens. So if you build a Uniswap pallet, you could basically use the information off of the Uniswap pallet, assuming there's enough liquidity on each of these tokens, to convert um, or to figure out what the also, conversion rate between any token and any native thing. Assuming that flash loans don't exist and that you check um, before pre uh slippage on your transactions. Yeah, it'd be pretty right. important to check before, make sure that people aren't changing the price on chain and then doing their transactions and then returning the funds. Yeah. Yes, the and, 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 and as you mentioned, an off-chain worker re requesting actual prices could work, but again, off you have to that there's you, there's a lot of something like off-chain worker is not necessarily simple. And then you know, building an entire off-chain worker system that actually gets prices correctly and accurately and in time and so like, these, like there's a lot of complexity here. What I'm saying is that start to start with like, I want to make um, fees and other tokens. I need to know how much that token is worth so that I can uh, charge an appropriate amount of that token for the fee related to the weight, right? In order to do that, I need to have some knowledge of price. So you need to solve that problem even before you can get to that point. So 
beyond the actual code of actually making it so that you can take a fee from another token. Like that, that code I think is doable and it's not probably not that hard. The economics of making that actually work and be done well is not trivial. So the question, while simple to start with, is quite complex. Yeah, Polkadot can provide Oracle functionality, but I, I don't think that, um, like, I don't think that's Polkadot's necessarily job right now. I think Polkadot's, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if Polkadot's going to provide an Oracle in the long term, but I think Polkadot is probably going to generally look to um, have an Oracle parachain or a set of Oracle parachains to provide this data. But again, That'd this be is like, quite important. Um, yeah, but this and then, be, by the way, that data is future. not easy to do. Again, you need to check that your endpoints that you're getting from are trusted. You need to make sure that every node who's has something at stake. So you pretty much need to create a whole second staking system within that palette itself, already on top of a blockchain. It, not not doable, just not easy, and definitely would probably need to be something that's consistently maintained and monitored. Yeah, because. Yeah, so that would end up probably being used in DeFi, which means that you have this <clears throat> large overhead risk of huge amounts of money flowing through that information. Right. Yeah. So again, I think that it's easy to say potential solutions, but when it actually comes to implementation, it's a it's a lot more complex. But it is definitely doable. Again, I would I would I would take a look at what the ORML guys are doing, and maybe they can come on um, on the seminar and present their um, approach to the to multi multi token transactions. Okay. Any other questions based off of that little conversation? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to end this one and uh, thank you all for joining. I'll see you all on the, the flip side. Thank you.